Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have all nine Enneagram types of ENFPs. And so Mary, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Hi, I'm Marie. Um, I am an ENFP, obviously um, Enneagram one wing two. And I came to that conclusion through much trial and error and mistyping. Um, it wasn't until I actually listened to Sleeping at Last's Enneagram album that I realized, oh, the reason I'm breaking down and sobbing over the one song is that I'm actually a one. So I am. Um, that's been a journey for me. Uh, I'm active on Twitter at jmarierightist. Um, and I talk about books and fandom and writing stuff from working on a novel and some short stories. So that's what I do. Absolutely lovely. And Caitlin? Hi, uh, my name is Caitlin Hockett. I am an Enneagram 2. I'm pretty sure wing one, pretty, pretty, pretty sure. Um, I am a certified Myers-Briggs coach as well as a certified strengths coach for Clifton Strengths. And I'm currently, uh, I've been doing some co-coaching with Heidi in her soul boot camp, which I'm sure she'll talk about. Excellent. And Deb? Hi guys, I'm Deb Dondlinger. I have known I was a three since 1992, but it was only a couple years ago that I figured out I was an ENFP. And I do one-on-one -on -one coaching transformational work using a whole bunch of different models. Yeah, and I don't like social media, so you have to find me on my website. <laughs> cool. And Chloe? Hi, my name is Chloe, and I am a four with a five wing. For sure. And Shen? Hi guys, I'm Shan. Um, I'm an ENFP, obviously, uh, five wing four SXSP. Um, I'm a doctorate student studying acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Um, I'm just starting up on a little YouTube channel and not much yet, but uh, plenty of blending of classical Taoist Chinese theory and um, philosophy blended with type stuff coming. I'm very excited about it. Anyway, on to Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm a six wing five, pretty sure on the wing. Um, and I don't have anything to plug. I'm pretty much only on social media for fun. But I am mom to like the best 16 year old on the planet, in my opinion. So I have to shout out to him. Um, and also, I figure, I've been doing MBTI stuff since I discovered Kiersey in like eighth grade, um, but never really got into Enneagram until Heidi's boot camp a few months back. Um, finally made it accessible and not like my head was going to explode. So big shout out to the boot camp on that one. And over to Aisha. Hi, I'm Aisha. Um, I'm a branch manager in a bank. I know I'm an ENFP. I learned about that about a year ago. I'm pretty sure I'm a seven. Um, only because I like toy with all of it, but really just the way I look at the world, like I truly believe that if you're doing FI work and if you're like following your heart and listening, then you're like making the proper contribution. And when people are doing that, like, wow, the world is incredible, it's so incredible. But I truly like believe that. So I don't know if that's like a social thing. Um, but when I listen to, I think I need to like listen to it and have a rapid conversation or something. But anyway, along to Heidi. <laughs> Hey, I'm Heidi. Um, I'm an eight wing 70 NFP, social sexual. And as has been mentioned a few times, I do a lot of work with ENFPs, 9FPs. I have a book called the, you know, the Comprehensive ENFP Survival Guide, which Joyce is helpelessly holding up because I just butchered the title, as well as the INFP, Comprehensive INFP Survival Guide. And now I'm running um, virtual boot camps for ENFP and INFP personalities. So um, I'm very passionate about kind of countering the stereotype of NFPs as kind of helpless in life um, and very like undirected. I think it's very A, unhelpful and B, inaccurate. Uh, so all of the work I do in the type field is really working on helping NFPs realize like how empowered they can be and how they can use their minds in the best 
possible way. Um, yeah, and I will pass it on to Michelle. Well, first of all, I just have to call out, and I know this is kind of off topic, but Heidi and Deb have such like a directness, and I love that. It's like very different from the rest of us. I don't know how to put it. It's like a, a directness with the way you speak. Anyway, uh, my name is Michelle. And I have a channel, Heart of Michi, and it has been MBTI for a long time, but I have been recently trying to expand my topic range because right now my main interest is developing and understanding my personal tastes and things, which is something I haven't really spent a whole lot of time trying to analyze and fully understand. So that's what I've been really obsessed with lately. So my channel is kind of taking that direction. Um, but yeah, I'm an a nine wing one, I found that out. Uh, well, I guessed that a few years ago because I used to think I was a seven. Um, but when I think about it, um, I mean, seven is probably my tri type, but it's definitely not like my main source of anxiety. <laughs> you have like a really distinct nine voice. Whenever I hear a nine speak, like it's very calm and soothing and relaxed. And, and then I feel relaxed too. And that's like the indicator. Um, and, and that's really cool. And I noticed, okay, so with me, like my voice can sound kind of nervous sometimes. And I re I'm a type six. And I realized that Sarah has the exact same thing. Like when she, we're both talking, it sounds a little bit nervous. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. So there's a bit of visual cues of, of type sometimes too. Uh, of course, that's not a that's not a way to type people, but it's cool to see trends. <laughs> and so, hi everyone, my name is Joyce. I'm a certified MBTI practitioner and I facilitate the instrument and organizations. I am also a life coach. And today we'll be exploring the Enneagram with all these ENFPs. <laughs> and we will start off with Marie. And so could you tell us a bit about how it's like being an ENFP type one? What are your type one works? Oh. Yeah, so this is this is why I had such a hard time typing myself with Enneagram. Like I thought I I was a seven because that seemed like very stereotypically ENFP, and then I thought it was a four. And I mean I'm pretty sure I'm a one four seven tri type, um, so that makes sense. But I always read the descriptions of ones as sort of perfectionists in like a very STJ kind of way. Um, or at least an SJ kind of way, like, oh, they're, they're detail people. They're very good at like schedules and being faithful to commitments. And like, if they say they're going to be somewhere at eight, they're going to be somewhere at 7.55. And um, I'm just kind of a hot mess. And so I never saw myself in any of the sort of practical descriptions. But as I learned more about it and read what other ENFP ones said about being a one, I really started to identify with the inner critic, the sort of moral perfectionist, um, this feeling that like, you have to be right, you have to be good in order to be okay. Like, like I'm almost, I'm almost about to tear up just saying that. Um, I, like this feeling that other, I'm only worthy of love if I'm good. Um, and yeah, I never see myself in any of the descriptions of ones as judgmental because I feel like as an ENFP, I'm really not judgmental of other people, but I am an incredibly harsh, like self-critic. I think we all probably are, but um, to, to like a pathological degree, there's like a very harsh voice inside that's constantly, you know, measuring me against some sort of impossible standard. I don't know. So those are a lot of the one quirks that I do relate to. Um, I feel like I don't look like a one, but my inside, like like my brain and my heart and like all of my self-loathing and anxiety is very one flavored. So for sure. And and so I'm wondering, could you tell us a bit about your relationship with anger as the vice of one? Yeah, I don't it's, that's one that like when I first saw that anger was the the vice I didn't immediately relate to but then reading about one's um, defense mechanisms of sort of if you have um, if you experience a negative emotion then you like over exaggerate its opposite so like um, trying to seem really on top of it and in control and like oh I, I resent this person so I'm going to go out of my way to like 
treat them fairly and and rightly and i'm going to sulk about it in my heart but not like show it um i definitely relate to that and and just like anger as resentment i think like i don't i don't feel like anger comes out a lot i have thunder and my lights are flickering um just you know punctuating my discussion on anger here i feel like um yeah, I'm. I like sublimate the anger, if that if that makes sense. I, I I stuff it all in, and and it it turns to like festering resentment, and um, and I definitely relate to the the one's defense mechanism of reaction formation, which is over exaggerating the things opposite. So. Cool, and. How about with the one's virtue serenity? What is your relationship with that? I don't I don't know that I have a great relationship with serenity, honestly. Uh, I I mean I'm working on it, I guess. I don't know. That's that's not something that like reading about ones with like moving into inner peace and all that. I don't know. I'm, I'm working on the inner peace. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much for dealing with my very piercing questions. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, you're excellent, Marie. And so ENFPs, relate, don't relate. What parts could you relate to the most and what parts were more specifically one of the description? I think the harsh self-critic is something I can relate to very much so. <laughs> yeah, I'm also very, very hard on myself. And I don't judge other people, but I judge myself intensely. Yeah, I was going to say that too. The same thing. I've got the same thing. I also I actually thought I was the one for a while. But it was one of those, like, I could identify with several things that were being said about it, but it never really was the primary thing pushing me. It was kind of like the best fit I could get out of what I'd read so far, um, but clearly some level of inner critic. I think there's some kind of, there's something in common with sixes and ones. I see that a lot. Like there's something going on there. Totally. I was at Catherine Favier's workshop two days ago and she was, she had a panel of sixes mm -hmm. and they, she asked them like, what type did you think you were before you found out you were six? And like half of them said one and I'm a six too. And I, I also wow. typed as one for the longest time until people kept telling me I, you're six. I remember <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've been seeing that across the board. It's across the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I guess it was about the compliant. Sorts, yeah, who are push themselves hard, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I really related when um, when Marie said, uh, I don't know if I have your exact words, but when you said the feeling of having to be good to be worthy or to be loved, that one was like, Ugh. <laughs> like that. That's that's definitely. Can I just strong. chime in? Um, the serenity, Marie. You radiate serenity without even knowing it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Deb, you're going to make me cry. Okay. Like, that's not allowed. I did my makeup for oh, that. Oh, no. <laughs> I do not radiate serenity. Like, you can feel the difference. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Great discussion, everyone. And so, Caitlin, could you tell us about your experience as a two and your quirks? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that might take a while. No. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay. So, I think... I think the um, hmm, the biggest thing for me is a two. And I, I wasn't sure if I was a two, but then when I went through Heidi's boot camp um, in the first round, we we went over Enneagram the the first time that she did it. She had some videos on that, and um, seeing it through the lens of being an ENFP as a two, and that you might serve people's needs a little bit differently. Because I'm not really great with physical needs. Like I, I barely tend to my own physical needs, let alone be aware of somebody else's. Um, but I'm, but I am very aware of people's emotional needs. And um, I think that 
that helped me pinpoint and finally, you know, embrace that too was most likely my core type because um, it's something that I think I'm often feeling drawn to help people if they are in some sort of emotional need or, um, yeah, just wanting to be there for people. And, and so that's definitely a strong thing for me as well as reading about the need to be like liked or loved or approved and feeling like you need to be offering something of value or being of service in order to be worthy of that love or approval or belonging. Um, I think what plays into it a little bit, I'm the youngest of four kids. So I think that um, maybe, I, I think especially when I was younger, I thought I had to be you know, funny or positive or happy or bright, like to just like get, maybe get um, whatever attention I was looking for or whatever that is. So I think, I think it all kind of plays in together and I don't know which comes first really. But, um, and then I think with that, with the the reason I think wing one, like I said, I relate to what Marie said about uh, feeling that need to be good as well. So it's like, I, I wanna be really good. I wanna follow all the rules that doesn't make any problems for anybody. I'm just like go along with everything and, and also um, like serve people in whatever way they might be needing in that moment, specifically, emotionally speaking. That is so, loving you that 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 makes you a great mother caitlin that you're just always tending to your kids emotional needs thank you, yeah. thank you. I'm, it feels a lot better to be out of the um i'll tell him this when he's older too the infant stage when you're not a person who's super in touch with physical needs it's really taxing because you have to be much more conscious and make a much more intentional effort for it but now that he's a little over two now you'll probably hear him at some point um now I feel like, okay, this is, it's getting to my time where I feel like this is where I'll, I'll thrive more. That's excellent. And so you'll Bob notice. Bob Cosby cried big <laughs> because of that one. Because I always tell Lila, I love you more every day. Like as she gets older, because I learn more and more about her. Yeah, when she was a baby, she was a creature. You know, and once in a while, they, they're they like a pet. <laughs> but the personality <laughs> that they unleash, wow. Wow. Yeah. I just really want an ENFP mom now. Like, they're just so <laughs> unconditionally accepting of their kid. And like, so oh, extra and embarrassing. <laughs> <no>? <laughs> I, I noticed with Caitlin's voice, it's very smooth. So I noticed the Enneagram types that have the smoothest and the warmest voices tend to be the two in the nine it just from trends so like don't don't type by visual cues like i said disclaimer but you can see a little bit of a trend there and and so caitlin could you tell us a bit about the two's vice of pride yeah this one i i feel like i'm still working this one out i don't know if i'm just not wanting to accept it <laughs> um but uh yeah, I struggle with it. I, I It makes sense. I was reading more again today, and I've read it a few times about that it's more about um, pride around not feeling that you have needs that anyone, like twos tend to to be there to serve other people's needs and then feel like they don't have any that, or or believe maybe that, that they don't have any, even if they do, and that maybe they serve those needs to somehow get their needs met uh, without having to ask for it. And so I think I'm still coming into awareness about this one, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to get better. So sometimes I'll, I'll specifically say something to my husband if we're having a conversation and I'll have to consciously stop and say, what I need from you right now is this. <laughs> I just literally have to say it to him, but it, I've only just recently become aware of what the thing is. I think I used to just um, maybe just feel sad or feel upset and not know why because maybe I had never even, it's not so much that I'm not stating a need that I'm aware of it. I just wasn't even aware of what it, what that specifically might be in the first place. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, and it can be difficult to ask for help, I think, and be the, the person who needs something. And that's another thing I'm becoming aware of that I never want to, um, I never want to put anyone out or be a burden or anything. So I, I think that's why I tend not to say, um, but it's not that I don't have, like, I know I have needs and they're in there somewhere. I'm just getting better at um, addressing what they are. I'm glad you're on the road of addressing your needs. <laughs> your needs deserve to be acknowledged. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And so 
Caitlin, could you tell us a bit about your relationship with humility as the virtue of the two? Yeah, um, that one I'm I'm more in touch with, not because I've mastered it or anything, but just because my parents always drove home that idea. Um, the way I was raised, it was always that um, you know you don't you don't brag about things, and you you like confidence was good, but not the but not arrogance. And there was always this thing about um, I don't know, you, you just not not thinking of yourself first it was it was thinking of others and stuff like that so so yeah i feel like my whole life i've tried to hit this balance because they're very supportive and and always wanted my siblings and me to be confident but also but not to a point that it would be taking away from anyone else so that so we were humility was something that we talked about a lot so i think that that's something that is more um familiar to me than thinking about pride which is something i'm still reflecting on for sure I noticed a lot of the defense mechanism of the two in your answer uh, of repression, where you mm -hmm. talk about repressing your own needs uh, while taking care of other people's. Mm -hmm. Very beautifully put. And so ENFPs, what parts did you resonate with and what parts were a little foreign to you guys? Well, I'm a one wing or a two wing. So I really related to a lot of it, especially the bit at the beginning about um, you know, you don't see yourself in the description of tending to physical needs as much, but emotional needs. And that was sort of a breakthrough that I had, again, listening to the Sleeping at Last Enneagram album, which cannot recommend enough. Um, the two song also brought me to tears, um, which I, I guess apparently I use as some sort of barometer of reality. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, just the impulse to take care of people and to, you know, meet their needs and, and be what they, what they need in that moment that can be like emotional and spiritual and like beyond just sort of like, Oh, here, I baked you cookies because that's not, I, I wish it, I wish it were my love language, but it's not. I just want, I don't, I want other people to say too, but I, before I forget, I just wanted to comment um, that I drove around one night and listened to every single song on the album for Sleeping At Last to, to wait. And that one hit me so hard. And I'm the, I'm the same way. I use the crying as a barometer because I, I usually think that tears are touching something that's true. And, um, and with that song in particular, the beginning, I think they're talking about physical needs. And then when it got to more emotional needs in the song, that's when I was like, kind of lost it and just felt that. And I think there's something about wanting to be that like, um, over I think, like they had he talks about the ocean and this like thing of love for people that you would all you know I think deep down a two would want also so they want to be that for others I really related to the lack of awareness about your needs I think like as an eight that's something I deal with like probably once we're aware of our needs it happens very differently after that point I can like over assert my needs in a not healthy way um but I also struggle with like identifying what kind of my more subtle needs are like unless they're right front and center i don't have a strong awareness of them um and especially like having that auxiliary fi that can be ignored very easily i think that that's um probably a common challenge with a decent amount of enfps um but i really resonated with that and then i was just going to say also with the humility piece i think and this is because like eight integrates to two, right? So it's like I've kind of worked with two energy a little bit myself as well. I think the humility piece is actually less so like recognizing that you're um, like humble about, you know, whatever you're doing and more so about realizing like, oh, I have as many needs as everyone else. And I am not like stronger or more inherently capable of like dealing with those. I also have to kind of work with like the childish and needy aspects of myself. Um and that's something like I I have not at all, not even close to mastered. <laughs> but I think that's the difference between let's say like the humility of the like the humility of the two versus three shows up slightly differently in that way. And um, yeah, that's definitely like the two energy is something I've had to work with as well. I think for me as a four, um, I relate a lot with. Um, with two in that um, it's the number that I disintegrate into when I'm not doing well. I am, the only thing that's different is I am very aware of what my needs are. I can imagine how it feels to not be, um, like that makes sense to me, but I, I guess myself, I am very aware of what my needs are, but 
I will suppress those. Um, I, I, I find myself like, um, yeah, not care, like I'll take care of others first um, to ignore those needs that because I feel like they might not be able to be met. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to go more into that when I talk about four later in the video. But um, yeah. Can I ask a question of Caitlin? Um, so the, the, t the twos in my life that I know, they, they have this amazing like love for everybody. Like they just have this deep love that, and do you know, does, do you recognize that when I say that? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, see, tears, <laughs> tears come when it's true. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't even know what to say to that. Um, just that. Yeah. Just that it hit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I feel it. Yeah, it's really cool. So. I really relate a lot to for sometimes, and I think this is because two is in my tri-type, but I also have that same thing where I need to be seen as helpful in order to have value. Um, and I can really, really, really neglect my own needs. And sometimes I think I don't even have needs, which is just self-toxic. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> um, but I, uh, like at work, for example, I'm not necessarily helping people with their emotions, although I would say I do that. It can also just be helping them. Uh, so like my last position was back office administrator. So um, I would make things easier for everyone else. And I made my life incredibly difficult. So when I had to transition into this new position where I was no longer able to do whatever else I was doing, no one could take over because I had it so complicated and convoluted that nobody could do it because I was trying to make it easier for everyone else that I neglected how much I had taken on to myself. So I, re I relate to that. I relate to that a lot and um, yeah, very much so. And I, I wanted to comment real quick on something Heidi said as well. Um, you touched on something I totally forgot about the humility piece about that it's about recognizing that you have needs. And yeah, I think sometimes I'll, I'll go in a spiral of like, even talking about being a two, I worry that it sounds like, um, oh, I'm so selfless or I don't, you know, that kind of thing. And, and which I guess plays into that pride and humility and then you don't want to look like that you think you're a, a you know a martyr or anything like that. So so I'm always very careful when I talk about it because I'm like I don't I mean I try to to meet needs but I don't know if I'm always meeting them and I don't know anyway it was just a thought that I had based on what you said Heidi. I relate to two a lot, but I think Caitlin said something about that there's like this they like take it out right. If you went into a room of people and somebody was having a really hard time, you will like go right to that person. I just feel like you have this pool to people that are in need. And I might happen upon someone <laughs> that is in need. And I do really attend to emotional needs, but I don't feel like that is what I'm doing. That's not my purpose. That's not why I'm in that room. Like that, that's not my, like it might have been that day, but I, I just have a different like I look at that differently but I feel like twos really have this like magnetic force about them that will take the right person like I don't think I have that that's my take it's a hot one your hot takes are lovely Caitlin thank you for the emotional honesty you are really good at deeply loving people and I, I like when I'm with you and like, you're just so honest and raw and loving my heart. I feel like my heart is pampered when I'm with you. So <laughs> you're, you're doing too well. <laughs> and so on to type three. So Deb, would you like to tell us a bit about your threeness? No, I don't. Um, uh, yeah. So it really sucks to be a three in the US because everyone thinks threes are this certain way. And you can see my Venus in even saying that. Um, so being a three and an ENFP has a really um, negative pattern and a very positive pattern. So the negative pattern is that 
very productive, very successful. You know, I typed as an ENTJ for many years and to refine my emotional center was a really big deal. <clears throat> so it's really easy for a three to get unhealthy. And I have TE dominant parent, like, you know, I have two degrees in engineering. I'm an ENFP with two degrees in engineering, put that together. It doesn't quite work. Yeah. So, so with a three being able to chameleon and really merge to what people need, I lost all sense of myself until I had kids. And then I had a kid and I had to protect my kid against my dad for being a jerk. And all of a sudden I found my backbone and I became like this attachment parenting mom and I breastfed and they slept on my bed even though my family gave me crap about it. I mean, having kids made me find my inner strength. Um, so yeah, a three as an NFP is challenging. Everything you said makes a lot of sense. And so could you tell us a bit about the vice of the three, which is self-deceit? Yeah, well, it actually goes both ways. So threes can be incredibly deceitful in how they present themselves to others. Um, we lie to protect ourselves. And I think you can, those of us with the FI awareness, we sort of, we protect ourselves and we can present a different front. Um, self-deceit, yeah, we I think I'm better than I am. I think I'm worse than I am. I have no idea who I am. Um, and when I found out, when I when I realized I was ENFP, which was like this incredibly painful process of like three months, somebody professionally typed me as an ENTJ. And I was went into this depression, like this is wrong, this is wrong. And I heard this line saying, FI outsources their self-esteem. And that just like grabbed my attention. Um, so self-deceit is, I don't even know who I am. That's what it looks like. And to it, it's painful to figure it out sometimes. So, and you can see how that overlaps with that FI um, in the second seat. So, I find that's usually the number one indicator that you're on point. <laughs> if there's pain involved. Yeah. Oh, well, the way I found out. Because nobody wants to like be yeah. who they really when are. I, I thought I, I'd been typed. And they're like, they're, 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 I'd been typed as Enneagram like, One. I was 21 and my senior VP, I was working with type me as a one. And then I yeah. went to a workshop and it was, um, I don't know, probably 30 people. And she starts talking about the three and I just burst into tears and that was it. So I think that we have that defining characteristic, like this is how we know. Yeah. That was touching. So with type threes, they tend to be typed as TE doms, like when people don't know that you're a three, but it's wrong. But I, I noticed that there's a strong correlation between people mistyping threes as TE doms when it's not true. Um, so that's a, something to watch out for. And so I, I love how the Enneagram is getting us to open up about our like our true selves. Like, <laughs> like I feel like the vulnerability has like hit, hit a notch of 10,000. <laughs> so that's really, really amazing. And so Deb, the defense mechanism of the three is identification. So could you go into that? Yeah, I read it. I didn't, um, I've never read the description of that. Um, I've actually never read about the defense mechanisms until you sent the link out. And I didn't like it because I see how well I do it. I just, I just sort of morph to the person I'm talking to and I like find it's really crappy. So I have, I'm still working on that. And I thought I was done working on being a three, but I'm not because yeah, it, that that was an eye opener to read that. So thanks for sharing that with me, Joyce. <laughs> yeah, like the three, what you're talking about, Deb, is like you identify with the stuff you do. And, and like, you don't identify with who you are, because you don't know who you are. And you start to identify with the persona that you put on. And that's the three struggle. And, well, and now I, I do know who I am, but I don't want other people to see it. It's It's vulnerable to show that. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's the vulnerability piece is showing it. Beautiful. And, and I so really identify with that a lot because I disintegrate into the three. And definitely when I'm under stress, it's, and we'll get into my projection later, but I, it's similar, but there's this weird projection on top of the integration as well. Like it's, um, I don't know. I can all I can say is like I really resonate with that, especially in times of stress. Obviously, I don't disintegrate into three, but I have um my tri type is five three nine, and some of my my one of my best friends and uh, a family member I'm very close with is uh, are, are both threes. So I, I 
have a lot of plenty of precedents for that. So um, even just some aspect of like, oh, I know who I am and I'm confident, but I'm gonna, you don't get to have that. You know, um, I get that like on a, on a visceral level. <laughs> And I, I admire the fact that you're even out here just saying that and, and being willing to be vulnerable enough to say that. You know, that's a struggle for a lot of us. And here you are, like, pioneering and saying your truth. And it feels like that's an ENFP thing. It, from what I've heard from yeah. ENFPs, I don't know. Yeah. So, but I want to, I want to talk about honesty. Can I talk about honesty, the gift? Um, yeah. So yeah. it's great. Like I get to be honest about my stuff and my struggles. So, and by being honest about my stuff, I inspire other people. Um, so I've learned it's so much easier just to like, you know, my, when I, my podcast is about me working through my own emotional stuff. It's easy to do when I realized it gets me to a better place. And I don't know if that's what honesty means is a virtue, um, in Enneagram terms, but that's how I, it's like being honest with myself. And also, um, one of the gifts of threes is that we see the the individual brilliance of each person, like we really see how they shine brightly as individuals. So it makes us like seeing the honest version of other people in their positive sense is how I experience it. So, and that's really, it's totally worth being a three to be able to feel that about other people. So, I can already tell that when someone rewatches this, they're gonna like shed a tear just listening to that. <laughs> Because, like, I don't know, there's something very vulnerable about mentioning how it took a while, but now you're able to be honest with yourself. Like, it's very relatable, and it's, like, it, it like, it's the most important lesson in someone's life to learn. And so you're, it's basically, it'll hit hard with people's hearts. I don't know. So it, it, it it's, it's affecting me, too. <laughs> and, yeah, um, amazing. And so ENFPs really don't relate your thoughts. I feel like threes always have this innocence about them. Like they just, when they learn something, they're like, oh, like, and then they want to share. Like, I always feel that from threes. And it's like, I might know something that would be hard for me to admit, but like, I don't have that wondrous. I don't know. Like I saw it in Deb and it was like, really, it's so cute. I love it. <laughs> I related to the bit about identification, um, which surprised me because like there's a lot of about threes I don't relate to because I have like kind of an absurdly strong sense of self and like that's why I thought I was a four for a long time. Um, I just have like this drive to like tell everybody who I am or whatever, but I think that's an ENFP thing. Do, do the rest of you like mirror in conversations like you start taking on mannerisms and even like vocal inflections of the people you're talking to because I do that or or like you know just even even when it comes to like um taste and like poly I mean not not like I don't know like I I will try to bring out the parts of me and what I think that like most resonate with the other person or you know I do that, that kind of thing so I, I really I do that. that to hide myself so yeah I really I do it to be liked <laughs> I do it when I'm unsure of myself like the more unsure of myself I am the more I'm going to try and start from that point of empathy because starting from that point of empathy is just a core ideology that I trust. And I know that if we can find agreement, everything else can come naturally. So I'll try and put myself in your shoes, identify, over-identify, <laughs> identify some more, um, whether it's mannerisms, voice, inflection, um, different jargon in different spaces. I'll really adapt my language a lot to whatever I think the other person needs. But I do sometimes let myself get lost in that. And I think the less confidence I have, the more I'm doing that. Um, or even if I am confident in one aspect of what I'm doing, if I'm been under a period of stress as well, 
I'll do that more. And sometimes it doesn't straight up feel like hiding. It's not as conscious when I do it. Um, but I'm either trying to mask not being confident or I'm actively using it as a strategy to get my way and get buy-in. But it's not like one, it, there's no in-between. Like it's it's one or the other. Um, and one's very conscious and one's very subconscious. Does that make sense? And can I, can I, so I never try to put myself in someone else's shoes. Um, you said that I'm just trying to figure out what they want. So I don't care about what it feels like inside of them. Um, so I think that's the difference between the three and the six, that you have the capacity to see multiple views and perhaps other types, but I, I would never, I, I only do that when I really don't understand the person. I'm trying to figure out how to respond to them appropriately, but that's not what I, I'm, it's more like, what's their facade? What is my facade? How does my facade meet their facade? So that was really interesting that you said that. Yeah. That's fascinating because I couldn't even begin to think about how to meet somebody's needs without considering their motivation. You mentioned like not putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And I wonder if you don't give yourself permission to put yourself in your own shoes. So you, it's harder to do that for someone else. So that's just, I would thought. perhaps agree with you maybe, or maybe not. <laughs> that's so interesting. I just have to say, I, I, I just realized I've never even, <laughs> I don't consciously think about a facade on one end or the other. And I realized that that is where I've, um, Heidi and I have talked about this, when we talk about vulnerability, like I've gotten into trouble with that. So that I've noticed that I'm the kind of person, like I played a game at at school in a, in a program where we were supposed to go around and trade certain things that were worth some unknown amount of something. Anyway, you were, so you were going, can I have one blue for your blacks or whatever? And I, or your reds or greens or, and I, I put it, I would just say, oh, here's what I have. <laughs> like, what do you, what do you want? And maybe I can help you. Like, I just, um, that's so fascinating to me. And I love, I love how, um, how like clear you are about the process that, and, and the way that you're thinking about it. I, I should have a little bit of that more sometimes. It would probably be helpful. I think one thing that kind of stood out to me, um, cause like three, eight and seven all being six types, I think what I heard when you were talking was like this sense of um, toughness with yourself and the way that you describe yourself. Like I can tell that there's like a standard you're constantly holding yourself to. But then when you talked about being a parent, there is this softness and like you were so able to be protective and aware of the vulnerabilities in someone else. And I think that that's very much a pinnacle of the assertive types. Like there's a repression of our own vulnerability, but then a very proactive approach to the vulnerabilities of others. And I really like related to that on a very visceral level. And um, if I'm like mischaracterizing you, correct me, because I kind of read between the lines there. It wasn't something you directly said, but um, that really hit home for me. Thanks I, for saying that. I, I completely agree and I never have thought of that. So yeah, thanks Heidi. I was just gonna say, I felt it from you when, I, when you said that comment to me earlier. I totally felt that that softness. I I generally can, like, I generally feel your softness. <laughs> yeah, it's it's there. See, <laughs> I, <laughs> but we, I don't know. we really don't want to know that. Threes don't want to know that everybody else can feel our softness. Like, we don't want to know that. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you. It's okay. Maybe. Okay, move on to please to Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's so interesting. So like Heidi said, the three and the eight are assertive types. I wonder, is there another assertive type as well? Seven. Seven. <laughs> I love the <laughs> Flexing. Yeah, I agree. I'm very, like I said to Caitlin, like I, if somebody is in need in that room that I'm always picturing of people in need, <laughs> I'm very like conscious of that. And I feel like that's what I've been doing with, um, a lot of my work activities are based on like, okay, this person feels if we could all be more vulnerable and we could actually be out there and more present and honest, and then a lot of problems could get fixed all at once. Like it would be like, if we can create this safe space, then everybody can just be vulnerable in, then it's like, who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> like that's what I'm always trying to create an environment. But yeah, not 
for me, not because I need that safe space. <laughs> And so, Chloe, would you like to tell us a bit about your four life? Well, I I might just jump in and talk about the about the vice um, first, if that's okay. Um, I thought it would, like Deb. I didn't know um, the 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 stuff that you had sent in the chat. I a lot of that 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 stuff I hadn't read specifically, um, and I was um, just coming aware of some of that stuff. It was pretty interesting. Um, but I, I guess I, for, for a while, I was between six and four on, um, on those types that I could be. Um, I was stuck between those. And um, I landed on four. Um, and I guess it was it was difficult to um, to d discover that I was a four because um, a lot of four descriptions are very ENFP ish, um, and FI is depicted as this individualist and stuff like that. And so I I, I thought that I um, could be an ENFP six. Um, like I wasn't sure if if that was just my being an ENFP, the feeling like, like a individualist or things like that. Um, I do relate with envy. Um, I, I don't relate with four, with the, with the four descriptions as much in that I don't feel the need to be super special or super unique all the time. Like I want to be special, but I don't seek to be more special than other people. Um, and I'm not particularly, um, super in, in, intimidated when, when other people do show, um, a, a, a large uniqueness in their creative expression that, 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 that could be just growth I've done too as a four. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I guess where, where the envy could come in or the, or the feeling like I, I need to distinguish myself is, um, is coming from a place of that um, that I I feel like I don't ha like I don't have a substance I don't have anything inside of me and that if I don't um, do something y unique or or dress in a in a way that's kind of unique um, that I I will just get lost in the crowd. And that I, I won't be seen. So it's it's not coming from a place of feeling um, like um, wanting to 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 distinguish myself is not coming from a place of wanting to be better than others or like an elitist type of thing. But it's coming from a place of feeling like I, I don't have anything um, or any kind of substance, and then kind of building up from there. Like and so in when I dress uniquely or when I when, um, when I do something that might seem unique, it may seem over exaggerated. And so maybe it seems like I'm trying to um, be that, that, that I think I'm more special or more um, deep or something like that. But, um, but it's, that's not really what that is um, in me. So, yeah. It's very four of you to start with the vices, like the most melancholic <laughs> type goes like, can I start with the vices? I'm like, that's very <laughs> fitting. <laughs> and so Chloe, could you tell us a bit about the virtue of the four, which is equanimity? Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm still working out. I, I feel like I've gotten um, kind of a, a good grasp on it, um, especially as a wing five i like to i, I like when I, I like to figure things out i like when things make sense um and i let's see i i feel like just it, be, being so um aware of my uh, of my subjective emotional ex experiences and of others as well um that um like there, there, there's definitely a con to it where I 
um, where if I, if I let myself sink too deep into those experiences um, and, and, and I get stuck in them, um, then, um, then, then that, that can be a problem. But um, it, it also, um, being able to move through the feelings um, and being able um, cause in, in order to, um, in, in order to get through the feelings to overcome them or, um, yeah, j- just like in, in, in order to be able to get through heavy, um, emotions like grief or loss or things like that, one needs to be able to sit with them and work through them and be aware of them. Um, so I feel like that has given me that ability, um, and also to be able to help others do those things as well, like not making people feel ashamed of how they feel. Like I, I really believe that all emotions, um, they they matter. Um, they all are, po- are pointing to something um, that, that 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 needs healing. Um, like I I can be very frustrated with people throwing around the word triggers and like um, stuff like that. Or just like 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 making jokes about them, because all all, all feelings, emotions, and, and triggers they, um, they 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 just point to an area of the psyche that that needs attention and love, um, and um, and yeah, definitely. I love the emotional awareness you bring. Yeah, and so Chloe. Could you tell us a bit about your defense mechanism introjection? Um, yeah, kind of a bit of like what I touched on before. Um, I don't tend to, to like to minimize um, or set myself apart from anxiety, um, from, um, from, from um, whatever emotions I may be experiencing or struggling with in order to be able to cope um, so I instead, I think, um, I, I take those on and I um, would, would rather um, talk about them outwardly and, and, and be vulnerable emotionally with others about what I'm going through and experiencing. I feel like it makes me braver to be able to take on the world and I feel like if I take it on, then I won't get criticized for it if that makes sense like um like if 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 i'm already talking about it and i've already identified with it then i can't get criticized for um for those things so yeah it's almost like you internalize all the bad things so then if someone tells you it you already accepted it yourself so no one can (laughs) really hurt you with something you already know yeah yeah Yeah. that's exactly yeah And so ENFPs, relate, don't relate, any commentary? Mm -hmm. It's my wing, so (laughs) yeah, a good amount of it. Like I I sit there and consider how other people's emotional experiences, like very personal emotional experiences are influencing their thinking and their stories and what they're communicating to you. And, And that whole part of, like she said about like if I own it first and it can't hurt me. So if somebody like Effie's a critical parent function for me. So if Effie tries to sit there and say like, you're not behaving properly because like something, whatever you're stubborn or whatever they want to say, they'll be like, yeah, that's right. I knew that. Like you can't hurt me. You can't move me. Uh, I'm already hurting. So I don't need more. Mm. Criticism. Yes. I don't need more pushing. So I get that for sure. And like that, that consciously not trying to be different. You're just kind of paying a lot of attention to, again, like the individual stories of other people and yourself too. So I get that. <laughs> yeah. Be quick about it. You almost had me crying, Chloe, when you're talking about. I have no substance. So I'm just trying. Yeah, that was like, for me as a three with a four wing, that's exactly it. Um, You described it beautifully, what it, how much it hurts and why we do what we do. So, yeah. 
I disintegrate into four. Um, so I really related to like those parts, like just, I think I do that defense mechanism more than my own actually. So like, you know, oh, I'm gonna get here first. And I like, I was actually thinking about, my, my therapist had this whole story about like a wounded deer and like, you know, you like exaggerate the wound mm. so that the hunter won't like hurt you, but like who said it was a hunter, I don't know. It, it's an interesting story. It probably exists on the internet somewhere, but basically it's like this gotcha to be like, oh, you just assumed that that person wished you harm. And so you like went straight to like, oh no, I'm wounded. Like, don't wound me more. But like, what if that person wanted to help you? And I feel like I do that all the time. Like, like I, I just sort of wrap myself with, yes, I'm hot. I'm horrible. I'm a hot mess. I am like selfish and inconsistent and like all of this stuff almost as a as a protection like if, if I say it first then you can't like punish me with it I don't know if that makes sense um I relate to that a lot makes complete sense something I noticed about your speech pattern Chloe is because like you're four you spend a lot of time like re reflecting and introspecting and you pause more when you speak and in, in comparison to the normal ENFP and and that's a super four thing because it's like you're going into the depth of your soul and your emotions so a good way to, to put the four is it's kind of like deep sea diving it's like everyone everyone can go deep sea diving but then the four has a special submarine that lets them go even further down and then like I don't know when Chloe when you're pausing it makes me think about you know the rich emotion you're and, and thoughts you're trying to pull up as you're pausing and that's amazing thank you mm -hmm. any more thoughts from ENFPs I thought of, when I was learning the descriptions, I considered like, because I really relate to people's individual emotional experiences, it's like, I think that's extremely important in life. I think that is life. But I don't feel like, again, like the, I don't know what the dominant type or something, pushy people. I don't feel like my experience, I'm not. I wouldn't be so off put by somebody having an unfair thought about me or something. You know what I mean? I feel like that would affect a four in a different way that it affects me. Like I don't like it, but I don't think it affects me in the same way. I loved what you said, Chloe, about um, feeling like every emotion matters. And it just made me very grateful that fours exist because um, everyone knows that that they can they can find a four that they can go to when they're feeling like who would want to hear about this or is this an okay feeling? Because I, I think as a two, sometimes I there's that like repression piece. You know, I want it to I, I want to stay positive or I don't want to focus and talk about my needs or whatever. So to be able to go to somebody who can um, validate that is really really great. So. Chloe, would you say that? the the uniqueness thing is almost more about like being like you want to be seen and understood as you are and not like in comparison to other people but just like because you know you, they talk about authenticity for fours and that's a big thing that I relate to is is like just I just want you to know who I am like who I really am and like that's why when somebody thinks something about me that's not true or says something unfair like you, like that's why it is so infuriating to me there's my anger um because it's it's like no you don't you don't get it you don't understand let me let me shake you until you understand and, and that's like why i'm tempted to like do some of them the like you know why i would shannon if i dyed my hair blue like that's why i would do it is like just wanting to shake people and be like no just like see me does does that make sense yeah would you repeat the question if if the like uniqueness is about like wanting to be seen for who you really are, like not in comparison to other people, like you were saying, but but just like wanting people to see and understand you, like for you. Yeah, that, that I, I want to be seen for who I really am, um, and I really I really value that for for uh, other people as well. Um, to be able to, for, for, for them to, to be able to also express their um, selves in that way to, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Yeah, 
Wonderful reply. And so time for the type five. So Shannon, would you like to tell us a bit about your type five tendencies? Sure. Um, so there's, you know, the, what do they call it? The vice, the aber, the, the vice, the virtue and the defense mechanism. And honestly, I think that's convoluted and I mean, I guess it could be helpful for some people, but I find it largely pointless. Um, it comes down to a detachment and that can be positive in some lights and that can be negative in some others, depending on how well you're using that to cope. Right. Um, I remember I have a very strong SI memory um, of my parents telling me to stop crying because they wanted to tell me something. And I, I neurologically couldn't do it, but I, FI felt so convicted to please them. And I tried like with all of my being and in that moment, like feeling that break where I could suddenly, like I could do it. I could hold it all in. I could shove it all down and watch them and listen. And there was that separation between myself, like my emotional self and my cognitive self. And I've been able to do that ever since. I, I separate and I detach from like so many different aspects of my life. My, my mental self, my emotional self, uh, my relationships between myself and one person versus other people, um, different aspects of myself. And I do that with information. Um, so in a lot of ways that can be, that can be great. I mean, I could sit there and I can dissect a lot of things going on and be pretty fair and non-judgmental and really get to the bottom of what's going on with somebody without, you know, putting them in a box they didn't want to be put into or, um, be unfair. On the other hand, um, you know, sometimes you might not receive messages back from me <laughs> for weeks and you're like, does she even like me? Um, and the answer usually is yes, I do. I'm just doing my thing. But yeah, if you think about almost like a scale, if you think about this quality of separation or detachment, I think it's true for all the types. We all have this little gift, this little quality, and that could be really positive or really not so great depending on where we are. So, um, yeah, mine's whatever you want to call it, avarice, um, detachment, or the defense mechanism of isolation. That was beautifully, beautifully put. Yeah, to sum it all up, Detachment is a good word, Shannon. Totally agree. <laughs> and so the virtue of the five is non-attachment. So that's your, like your skill. When everyone is over-personalizing, the five is able to be like that Buddhist saying, yeah. where it's like the Buddhist notion of non-attachment. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, like that comfortable silence when you, you're cool with somebody, you know they're not out to get you, but they're just sitting there going, mm-hmm. Like I'm very literally doing that most of the time. Like I'm usually not assigning any particular meaning to what somebody is saying. I'm thinking about like, what is it like? I have this very like romantic, cause I'm a sexual five on top of that. Um, in terms of instinctual variant, a very romantic attachment, like view of life, right? Where I, the Constant Question, it's a very old movie, but I don't know if anyone's like watched any like 90s um, movies. Um, City of Angels, there was this scene where the guy said to the girl like, or no, it was the girl said to the guy, like, what is, I want to know what a pear tastes like. He's like, you've never tasted a pear? He's like, no, I just want to know what it tastes like to you. That's kind of my constant mindset. Well, just because I know what something is doesn't mean I don't know what it, what it's like for you or what it's like in this frame, this any frame or that any possible frame. So I'm always, always wondering and trying to get to the bottom of things and not for any particular reason. Like there's no, I don't have an intention. I don't have a 
thing I want. I like purely the knowing is what I'm after. Mm -hmm. So, so there is an attachment. Like there's no, I'm not trying to get anything out of you. Like just you telling me things is the reward. Yeah. That on top of you being an ENFP, who's a perceiver dom, you lead with a perceiving function. Any, it adds to the ability to, see it as information <laughs> to take in yeah yeah totally I mean, in one frame you could sit there and say that a wolf is a nasty predatory animal and in another you could say it's benefiting the environment by making sure there's not overpopulation and things aren't suffering and dying like needlessly you know we just pick off one or two that were on their way out So there's always different ways to see things. So like, who am I to assign meaning, like assign judgment in that way? Yeah. I want to see a complete picture of what a thing is, what the wolf is or what the thing is. Yeah, that's beautiful. They say that NE is multiplicity or dimensionality. So ability to Mm -hmm. see the multiplicity of something. And you describe that so effortlessly and beautifully. And and so ENFPs really don't really tell me your thoughts. So Shannon is like what I aspire to be, like just so succinct and to the point mentally. If you put us in the same room, I don't think people think we're the same type just because of how clearly you think. So I think that's showing the real difference in the anagram types, the three compared to the the five. So just the mental clarity came up through so clearly for me. Is something I would admire, but not think I could be. Yeah, I mean, it's five is my wing. So I definitely have some of that detachment and the love of figuring out what something really is just for like the purity of the truth of whatever that person's experience is. And then you know, it's fun to, I think I, 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 I really related when she's talking about sectioning things and putting things in the right context in the right containers. And it's in my head, it's all, you know, like what's the coefficient in front of the variable? Cause I'm kind of mathy, but um, everything's gotta be in the right context. There's no, there's no one answer for anything. Um, and it's certainly, even though I would try and consider all the facts, I know I wouldn't ever have them. Um, so yeah, I definitely relate, but it's it's a thing that helps me. It's a thing that I do, but it's much more like a tool that I can pull out. Um, kind of like, you know, you think about TE in that tertiary position and you can kind of consciously go grab it. It's, it's, not, it's not where I'm swimming every day, but I very much relate to all of it. Does that make sense? Look at all our heads go. I really relate um, to the extent to which you kind of differentiate between like your own perceptions and other people's. And I've always had, I feel like a very natural kind of comfort around fives. And I think that gave me some language for why, like when you were talking about asking the question, what does this taste like? You're not asking, what does it taste like for the collective? You're asking for you as an individual autonomous human being, what is this experience like? And I think that the eight and the five tend to very naturally share that kind of worldview of like everyone is their own and probably some other types, um, but everyone is their own like independent autonomous human being with a completely different experience from everyone else. And there's, I think as an any dom and as a perspective shifting shifter, like a very, very natural tendency to want to explore and be interested in what that's like from all of these different perspectives. Um, So I thought that was really interesting because it kind of gave me language for something that I was like, oh, that's very A, prominent in myself and B, a good explanation for why I tend to find very little I think there's a mutual (laughs) awareness. That's funny. I really relate to what you're saying about like wanting to understand everything and even like for its own sake and see how things fit together and like where where things fit you know i'm i'm a librarian by training so um organizing and understanding and analyzing information is like my jam um but 
I like the whole time you were talking, I was just like, what must that be like to have distance from it? Like I'm right there in the middle. Like I, I really struggle with like being too far into like even just harrowing news stories or like, I have to, I have to be careful, like what I, what I read or like, I can't watch scary movies with children in danger. Like I just, I, I'm, I, I, can't pull my emotional experience out of the like cognitive experience. And I, I just, it was so interesting to hear you talk about like the layers that you have. Cause I, I understand, I, I identify with part of that drive. I think the parts that are maybe more ENFP, but then just like the, the five bits of it, I was just like, wow, that must be so interesting. <laughs> First, Deb, I think you totally have clarity of thought. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Um, maybe you have a high standard for it because it's something you're already pretty good at. Because um, I was thinking the same. I wish that that I had. I was thinking that when you talked and when Shan talked as well. Um, uh, that's something I wish I had. And what I was going to say about um, what I relate to is that I think I very highly value being able to separate those things out and be detached, which is why I'm drawn to these kinds of frameworks that we're talking about right now. It's why I love Myers Briggs. It's why I love Clifton Strengths. I like to, an Enneagram, I like to be able to parse things out. But I think the difference is I have to work really, really hard and intentionally to do so. And it sounds like it just sort of happens for a five. Yeah, I I was saying that's sort of like for me. That's what I was thinking. Like I love doing the kind of thing that she does, like how that collection of information. And I've even considered that, like when I got into art, I remember being like under and thinking, I wonder what blue looks like to other people. Like just because the sky is blue to me, like Michelle's like I know. <laughs> I thought that before. I'm like, yes. I wonder if your blue is <laughs> orange or something like. It was just the my brain exploded that day because I was just like everything is so subjective. And then I think <laughs> the five ness of me is more like uh, it makes me nervous. Like I, it's not a comfortable place for me to be. Yeah, I was gonna point out the detachment is kind of a catch twenty two. It's not always the best thing, especially when you're like a woman and a feeling woman on top of that, you get treated like a thinker woman a lot of times and get like assigned a lot of negative meaning that isn't there. Like, Oh, she's just, she's just cold and attached. She doesn't care. She's being vindictive. She's condescending or like whatever people tend to feel like, underneath the surface. This is literally that they're not what honest. you want. <laughs> you don't want to drill really down here. <laughs> Your fours underneath, just like what the fuck. And like, I do feel really a lot, and I'm very sensitive, and feel very deeply. But it takes me a minute, you know, like to like come up with like the words, or like I'll have to go like process for a while. I'm sure everyone can relate to that with FI. But um, sometimes people will be like, "What are you feeling?" And I'm like, "Well, it doesn't matter what I'm feeling right now. You want something specifically." <laughs> And I don't know what that is. So I could sit here and tell you an entire story of what I feel, but that's not really so, the, the question that's being asked here. Um, shoot. So yeah, the detachment comes with like a whole lot of nuance and like pressure. <laughs> like if there's an empty void, somebody, people will always fill it with something whether or not it's true. That is so, so true. Any last thoughts before we move on to six? Yeah, um, Shannon, I might have missed it. What has been your struggle towards development? Like what has been your aha integration? Um, I don't know how to say that properly, but no, I know what you're saying. Um, gosh, it's just going to mess um, because it's a strange combination of mm -hmm. type to have. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a continuous journey. A lot of it is like, I mean, I'm just starting to make my, my content online and going after things I want to go after. And I'm actually like really happy and excited about it. Like I feel like I'm on a upward trajectory as my ENTJ best friend says but 
it took me a while to find my thing. And sometimes I still want to cower back and hide and isolate. And especially now, like I'm, I'm dating someone who's also a five. So I have to see a lot of my own tendencies on the outside and go, Oh, that's why people thought that I was condescending. Ooh. Um, or why they thought I was glaring at them when I really wasn't. Um, so I have to see my, a lot of myself constantly, but it's more of a, again, like an attached thing of like, you know, it doesn't matter what you like. It doesn't, you can get caught up in that story, but you're, all you're doing is not taking responsibility. Like you're a part of everything. And by you refusing to re take responsibility for your part of things by like trying to contribute what you know, like you're just forcing more effort onto other people. Like I try to take the path of least resistance and not be noticed a lot, but like that's without totally, without totally, um, getting rid of my individual attachments and viewpoints on things. But like, that's kind of the truth. If you're not taking responsibility for yourself, you're not putting out what you know and what you're, what you're about, your talents, whatever, you know, you're in some, some indirect way, you're going to make life harder on other people because you're not doing well. If you're not living up to your best potential, you're put taking up your input, like, impact on things and somebody else has to make up for that and that's not fair like that's not fair to people who love me that's not fair to you know eight, like 84 year old me who's going to be on her deathbed going like did i do a good thing with my life like that it's not fair to my mother it's not fair to my father it's not fair to my i don't know it's not fair to a lot of people past present and future so like even if it's not the best thing in the whole world, um, even if it's not totally complete and confident, you still got to contribute something, and that something is going to help somebody. So it's not like I, I tell myself all the time, and I constantly battle with it. Is I don't want to like make these videos. I don't like being seen, but I still have to sit there and be like, it's not about you. It's about everybody else, and you're a part of that. And how bad would you, like, how guilty, like, how terrible would you feel if you, you know, made someone else's life harder by not making it easier for other people to be the best versions of them? How terrible would you feel if anyone else in this chat room didn't live up to their best potential? You know? So that's what I keep going back to. I could not possibly resonate any harder <laughs> with anything you just said. Like, that... Like, I felt that in my soul. That was so, like, <laughs> such a mirror of the way that I feel about a lot of the work I do as well. So, like, thank you for, again, putting that out there and giving me language. And <laughs> something that was incredible. That's cool. That's a, that's a good sign that I'm going into my eight there because the eight just told me that was, that was good. That was resonant. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You you also integrate healthily to eight, Shannon, when you defend me from people who attack me. So like basically, um my whole life I've had I, ch I channel my Nicki Minaj and and defend you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically when you're online, people sometimes bully you and stuff. And like, I've never actually gotten defended. Like every time that like someone has done something horrible to me, I've always like been the one who had to take it with no one else to defend me. So Shannon was probably like the first person ever who's ever stuck up for me in my life. Um, and like she she did a day thing, like where she saw someone mistreating me and she stepped in and I'm like, no one has ever done that before, no one. And, and so, yeah, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> you're 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 really great at tapping into that healthy integration debate. Yeah, and so you'll notice with the type four and the type five, they have a pause and speak type of speech pattern. They're probably, in my opinion, like the most introspective enneagram types too. So you'll notice with Shannon, and you'll notice with Chloe, who are the five and the in the four, that they tend to for an ENFP, pause more than the average. Um, and it can almost seem like they're an introvert, but they're not. I, they're not. <laughs> 
but it's so it's that's an interesting enneagram tell uh, disclaimer do like like i say ten thousand times do not type off of verbal or visual cues that's I, I I do not agree, but please no one bully me in the damn comments. I know you get to say someone talks slow. <laughs> I, she gets it. Everyone it's okay, Heidi and I will. Heidi and I will protect you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Joyce, I have to say, I just want to give you a ton of credit for all the work that you do because I was sitting here feeling nervous about things that I said just in the last hour and you pump these out constantly. <laughs> so the, it's just, it gives other people, I think the courage to do it too. Um, so thank you for putting yourself out oh, there. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that I give you surrogate courage. So a word that I've liked to add to words now is the word surrogate. <laughs> like, I saw it used before co colloquially and it's pretty interesting. You add it to anything that someone else gives you. So like, <laughs> th th thank you. I'm, I'm glad that I gave you surrogate courage. That <laughs> um, and yeah, Shannon talked about endeavors that she's heading on. She has a YouTube channel called Ask a Hippie. And she's also um, a partner of the website that I'm having coming up within the start of this this year, new year. So yeah. And so you'll see her around and we're, we're starting that up together. And so the type six, Sarah, would you like to tell us about your experience as a type six? Sure. Um, so, my experience as a type six is really there's a certain amount of sectioning that happens but i'm on guard all the time and i'm actually this like crazy optimistic person but the way i get there is i assume the worst case scenario and then i reason my way back to why i'm safe and that's going on like all the time does that feel right for you too, Joyce? Do you have some of that? So for me, I'm a type six. I, I do go to dark places, but I normally don't go to the optimism. So I'm you without the optimism. <laughs> it's a very learned thing. Um, but yeah, and there is this natural ENFP optimism on top of it. So like, you know, whether it's political news stories or just people in my day-to-day -day life or somebody says something at work, like I will absolutely assume the worst. And then once I've dealt with the worst case scenario, then it's not as bad. And then it's not as bad. And hey, we landed in this like super great place. Um, and that's where the ideas come from. And once I get to that place, that's where I can do more of the, I don't know, any TE, go find a solution on the fly. Um, and my background is in statistics and economics. Um, so I, I've got kind of a very heavy math and analytics background anyway. So some of what Shannon was saying with having things in the right buckets and you don't want to attribute things to the wrong source of the information, um, I'm there. But for me, it's not like there is some beauty in the purity of truth. But that's not what's driving me. Like for me, knowing what's true is helpful so that I can be safe and know what to trust and what not to trust. So I hope that that makes sense. But that's kind of where I am overall, all the time. Um, I think the best example, and I know I've shared it with at least a couple of people here. Um, like if I wanted to explain my ENFP sixness, I am Catholic, I'm a late life convert, and I also absolutely love sci-fi time travel stuff. And I have spent a ridiculous amount of my life contingency planning for what happens if I got sucked back in time and I couldn't prove to the church that I was actually baptized and like, how would I get into the sacraments? And I've got different contingency plans for like different time periods. Is it, you know, pre- Judaism? Is it while well, Judaism is active pre-Christianity? Is it post-Christianity? And then where in the world? Like so many. And they have a ridiculous dependency on like knowing certain things in Latin for the post-Christian scenarios. And yes, I go and I start and try and learn Latin multiple times just in case. 
so that's that's my best description of six plus any dom. <laughs> so cute. Oh my god. I love it. That's where I am <laughs> all the time. Like, I need to be able to pray. <laughs> Well, and it, but what's interesting is it's it's more than just prayer, right? You can do that anywhere, but there's this community and there's this ideology that it took me a long time to find, and it's really like the only thing I actually really really trust. And my life was a hot mess, um, oh. and until I found the church, and some of that is timing and a lot of it is you know as i was developing around that same time i i joined the church when i was 33. so it was right at the same time i had my son and like just kind of everything came together all at that point mm -hmm. so i don't want to you don't want to like undervalue or overstate the faith component of that um but it, it's significant and it is it is the going to mass is the most si thing i do it's the most healthy thing i do it's where i ground myself everything else can come from that um but i i know it's just one way that people get to that spot as well does that make sense like i I don't you know, I love how I love how much like intellectual energy you pour into that thing that you love that like that the community and like how many people must get so much out of that too. And you just add that 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 depth and that layers of of knowledge to things to make sure that you can connect with them. Like that's kind of, that's beautiful. Well, I love how you like. I feel like that's so ENFP to be like. I understand that this is a subjective experience to me, but I don't want to belittle this experience because it's really magical what I have here. Look at it. <laughs> I relate to that. Uh, all I was thinking while you were talking about your contingency plans is how incredibly stressful that must be to have to feel the need to come up with these contingency plans. And like, I would imagine that as soon as you think, oh, okay, what if I was in this period of time that you almost feel like you need to figure it out right when you think about it and you can't wait until you get that figured out. Am I like reading that correctly? Well, it's actually completely the opposite. Oh, interesting. Like, the way I deal with stress is I have a plan for everything. Like if I've planned for it, then I don't have to think about it in the moment when it would be stressful. Um, and That's some of efficient. <laughs> Some of that's the way I was raised. Yeah. Um, some of that's the way I was raised. Like my dad definitely had us doing fire drills all the time. And, you know, we were prepared. That's an understatement. Um, but yeah, like it, by starting in the worst case scenario and just knowing that you've got that covered, then you're freed up to just enjoy the moment and enjoy what's going on. You've already got it covered. I know where every exit is. I know where my earthquake shelter is. Like, I know where all of it is. And so I know what to do. And now I can just be here and enjoy these lovely people and focus on emotion rather than, you know, always being analytical about everything. But yeah, there's, there's part of me that's always, always thinking and always planning. When you speak, you remind me so much of my best friend who's an INFP6. And like, I love the combination of our types because I think that um, where eights and sixes are very similar is like our willingness to kind of look at the worst in things. Um, like both types will, will kind of not be overly optimistic, um, but I don't do the contingency planning thing. I'm just kind of like, well, if the worst happens, we'll deal with it, right? But I have no problem being like, oh, this person could do something really bad. Like this situation could go really, I don't assume the best in people um, naturally. So, but it's like, it's funny because my dynamic with my my six best friend is like, she's always planning for what could go wrong. And I'm always like, dude, calm down, it's not happening. Like that's look around, that's not going wrong right now. But then when it does go wrong, so like coronavirus, right? The beginning of this year, 
that happened and I was kind of like, oh shit, like this is bad. And she just moved in with me right away. I was like, no, it's fine. Like you don't have a pandemic plan. Like I have a pandemic plan. <laughs> so it's like, as soon as things were bad, she was calm. And it's such an interesting existence. And it's like, I find it um, intuitive intuitive sixes I vibe really well with not so much sensing sixes because I find I can't really like meet them where they're at because they're dealing with such tangible stuff um but I really love that about the six like it's like they're so calm in moments of crisis um and I think they aren't given enough credit for that as a whole well yeah like I can definitely be calm in the moment of crisis but I'll fall apart afterwards like if it's if it's Especially, you know, COVID's kind of hard because it's a long sustained crisis. But um, for more like in the moment things, like if somebody needs CPR or, you know, somebody's bleeding or whatever, the car's going to drive off a cliff. Like I can be very, very calm until everything's okay. And then once I'm sure everyone's safe, that's when I'll just be like, okay, here are all the tears come. Now I'm shaking. Now I'm freaking out. Um, but it's after everyone's safe. Like there's, there's a real safety thing there, but yeah, with coronavirus, like, again, don't want to mitigate the upheaval that it's caused in millions of people's lives and tragedy and things like that. But from where we were sitting, it was like, we were two weeks ahead on everything. The only thing that wasn't like kind of pre-set up, pre-arranged was we wanted to get some of those N95s kind of early January when they started talking about it in China. Um, and we were good. It was just, it was just transition and grab this from this room and do this with that room. I actually appreciate I knowing. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say real quick. I appreciate knowing the, the whole like falling apart after the fact thing. Cause that wasn't something I knew about sixes. Um, so that gives me like a mental note to check in on sixes after a crisis that I otherwise wouldn't have necessarily known to do. Um, I don't know if it extends to all sixes, but certainly with NFP and FI, like that is a thing that I would not do in front of other people who are not like my super, super, super inner circle. Um, it would definitely not feel safe to show emotion related to the thing that just happened until it had been well processed and ready to articulate carefully. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, that was kind of long, but no, I, could, I could relate to a lot of it. Like I have a six wing, obviously sometimes I'm more of a four wing, but I go into six wing and I taught myself like Krav Maga and w carry weapons up my sleeves and taught myself like agriculture in case of like an apocalypse. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm just ready at all times for somebody to turn around and betray me. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, that, exactly that. Um, like I was ready for that. <laughs> like I, I, the thing that's going on in my head right now is like, yes, I want to agree with you and acknowledge that like I'm there, but I don't actually want to expose specific tactics or reserves that right. I have because this is going out on YouTube. Oh yeah, that would give away oh, my. Yeah. I've, got, I've got way more than that, but like, <laughs> thank you. But that. like, I'm so prepared. <laughs> like at all times, like there's a little. Like I go in my six week when I'm extra nervous kind of thing, and I'll look around at my environment and be like, "Where are all the points that can hit you?" <laughs> like, yeah, like I'm ready for this. Oh yeah, and you know when, you know after I've got my little plans oh, in my head. Yeah, after how I'm gonna hit and run shootings and things like that. Like my poor son who was a four. Like, oh, yes, we walk, we walk into anything at the high school or a movie theater or something like that. I'm like, list the exits. Where's your hiding spot? Like, where are you going? And if you don't practice it ahead of time, you don't have it at the ready when it's time to go. So I think that's like my most defining sickness. Because um, <laughs> that doesn't feel like an ENFP thing to me. I don't know how everybody else feels, but like, I, I relate to the feeling of, of feelings like scared of everything all the time at least maybe not like tangibly physically but I have a lot of like existential panic just just like all the time um but I I definitely don't find that thinking about it brings me more comfort <laughs> like much less 
I think it's tied to SI. So if I have nothing to draw on, then I deliberately go to contingency planning. If I have no experience, and it's, so I just have to sort of pre-think through different options. So it lets me get creative with something that's unknown, but it's sort of a stress response for me is when I'm just like, I have no idea what to do here. So then I think through all the possible worst things I could do. Like when I put out a book, I actually wrote the worst possible review I could ever get because I was so scared of getting a really bad review. So I just wrote it for myself and I figured out, okay, this is what I care about. And I made sure I didn't do what I did, what I cared about. Um, it was perfect. So it's a stress response for me to think about what doesn't work. It makes sense because I also have six in my arrows of integration. So, yeah. I say I've, I've had like horrific existential thoughts from as far back as three. I don't really have a choice. I didn't think there was a choice. It's just there. Yeah, it's definitely tied into the SI stuff. You know, like you can't solve it, but like you can kind of like with the NE SI integration stuff, if you start to be like, I can control these little, I can figure out what to do anyone's in the big picture well and i think any lets us see where it can go so much more mm -hmm. quickly than many people that if you're if you're scanning the world that way all it takes is is a little tweak in the permission you give ni and then yeah clearly an apocalypse is around every corner right but let's just be <laughs> comfortable with it um have that little FI fantasy of being the star who survives the apocalypse. We can get there. <laughs> so um, anyway, do you want to do vices and virtues? Oh, well, like yes. That, that's very much part of it. But I also feel like I was doing a lot of what Shannon did with the things that were listed for the virtue and vice were fear and faith. And I was just like, no, those are the wrong words. Like, I'll give fear some of it's okay, but like faith is not the right word. And maybe that's the wing five coming out. Um, and I went through this whole thing because it, there is some element of, I started this off by saying the thing that, where I felt safe, the thing that like I have to have in my life is my faith and my church. But I don't feel like that's specific to any particular Enneagram or any particular Myers-Briggs. Like, if it's the thing that anchors you, it's the thing that anchors you. And I certainly wouldn't ever want to imply that faith is specific to any one section of the population. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a lot more about trust. Because when I'm putting everyone in buckets... Like there is nobody that I trust a hundred percent. That would be ridiculous. Um, you know, and like, I think I use that word trust much more carefully than other people, but I am looking for people and especially like frameworks, ideologies, paradigms that I can, I can really invest in and trust in a lot, but none of them is really going to work for every situation, right? Like I will, I know my son loves me and is always well-intentioned to me. There's never any malevolence or anything like that, but I would not trust him to fix my roof. I would not trust myself to fix a roof. I would want somebody, you know, I would do a certain amount of research to see if I could trust a certain person to fix my roof. So it's very situational what that trust is. And I have yet to find a person I could trust all of the time for everything. Like, I just don't think that that's in the capacity of what it means to be human. I don't even, I certainly don't trust myself all the time. Um, and that there's no implication of like bad intent or motivation behind it. It's just acknowledging the truth that sits behind where we are and I'm tired of, you know, that defense mechanism is projection and I'm constantly projecting my things onto other people and then watching them not solve it for me. Um, so I'm, I'm tired of hoping so much and being disappointed 
that it didn't work out the way. Like my constant experience is just people will disappoint me at some point. Even the people I'm closest to who have been with me for huge periods of my life that I, I desperately love and I know there's no bad intent. But that's not the same as like I can totally count on you for everything all the time, whatever. And some of it's just different, different frameworks. Um, some of it's, you know, like I'm right in the middle. I've got tons of blue friends and tons of red friends and different conversations go different way. And I trust some of them on some issues and some of them on other issues. But in terms of an entire cross section of issues, trust different people for different things, different levels of education, different ages, different, you know, judging axes. Like my mom's an ISFJ. I know she does everything in the world to protect me and set me up for success in life, but I don't trust her to make the decision that's right for me in a lot of situations. Um, you know, and it comes up in quirky ways like gift giving and things like that. Um, yes, mom, I see how that would be awesome for you, but just not for me. So there's always this like probability variable that just there's, it's actually a coefficient, not a variable I must spoke, but there's this probability coefficient in front of every single person, every single thing all the time. And how much I trust, like it's just this probability scale that's a function of many other inputs as well. We're definitely talking about simultaneously solving a system of equations 100% of the time. That's that's how I approach everything. Um, so when I get super stressed out, I do tend to let the negative probabilities, like I'll put more emphasis on probabilities associated with negative events. Um, big fan of saying, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And I will definitely, you know, I think what I do when I'm stressed is I lose who I am to a certain extent. I, I start focusing externally as I think all ENFPs would when we're, when we're, you know, starting to loop, right? You kind of get that external focus and then I'm disintegrating into the three and I'm trying to do some of that over identifying with people. But through that process, I'm somehow pushing my own stuff out there that in somewhere I know there's some part of that system of equations that's not being solved for, but I'm not focused on myself. I'm focused externally. So I'm sticking it out there. And I think that's that's what really drives the projection. Um, it's definitely a thing that I do. For me, because my faith is such an important part of what lets me trust, lets me be okay, lets SI not always be the tail that wags the dog, um, it feels wrong like it, it feels like it's it's almost belittling the supernatural role of God in faith to include it as something I could ever claim as a virtue. So, if, and it, it just didn't hit the nail on the head in terms of what I struggle with. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't want there to be any misconstruction anyone misconstruing what I was saying um, if I was using that word faith. So there's there's this cautious and, and maybe it's that always contingency planning, but I, I tend to be on the one hand, the bubbly ENFP who can't shut up. And at the same time, very careful of the consequence of my words. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to misuse the words. I'm, I'm constantly going back to definitions. Um, I love high school debate. I spend a huge amount of time coaching and things like that. And I'm topicality. What's the definition? Like, let's go back. Who's your source? Over and over again. And I spent I just spend so much time in that space. Um, so the the vice virtue pairs, I'm I'm a little fuzzy on how we're supposed to read those. Like I, I think I was looking at it almost as like the virtue is is sort of like the answer to the vice or like the way through it. Like if you focus on that, 
it can be like a key to unlock the vice and not so much that like your type naturally has that as a virtue, but, but like, it's sort of, I don't know, aspirational. Maybe that's just me as a one being like, everything is about self-improvement and what you can build towards. But Well, I and I, I do think it is with the self-improvement. I was looking at it as obviously none of these are binary. They're all, you know, a continuum. And so how we would improve, and it was trying to narrow down what are what's our Enneagram fear? What are we focused on? How do we get there? And then how do you move within it, I think? Yeah, I, I should have clarified this at the beginning. So with the vice, it's what the Enneagram type struggles with. So it's the fixation of their life. And so the virtue is how to overcome that fixation that you're is taking reign over your life. Um, and basically the defense mechanism, a lot of Enneagram experts say that the best way to type someone is off of their defense mechanism. That That's just something, you know, I've, I've heard around the space. But I do think that like the, the most reliable way to type someone in the Enneagram is off of energetic feel and vibe. Because there, I would have never known I was a six. Like when I first read about the Enneagram, I read through them and I thought that six wasn't a possibility, but it was like through people feeling my energy. They're like, oh, you have this like apprehensive, nervous, kind of scared, intense energy, Joyce. And that's like very six. And then that's when I figured out my type. Otherwise, I would have never figured it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so totally, totally interesting chat. And so Aisha, could you tell us a bit about your experience, your experience as a seven? Yeah, I um, when I started learning about Enneagram, I learned after I knew I was an ENFP. So I feel like a lot of people ask me if I was a seven or like would suggest the right. Well, you're a seven. <laughs> but I'm like, well, just because I like colorful shit doesn't mean I'm a seven. But I like, I feel like I can see myself in all of the types and I can put myself in <laughs> situations. <laughs> but my overlying like motivations for life like what I what my intentions are what my story is what my purpose what I feel yeah it's more of an energy thing it's like this is what I'm always aiming towards is to elevate somehow something and it, it doesn't always it's not always the same thing and it's not always but underlying I feel like that's always existing for me and what were what were the vice and virtues that I chose the words for seven? I know I had a question because I thought it was interesting that the vice for seven and the vice for eight were like very similar in the article that you sent, but like very different. And I kind of understood that because like, no, I'm like, Heidi, no offense. But like, <laughs> I always see eight as like more... Like sevens, I, I have very strong feelings about selfishness. And I have like a lot of like thought about that in, within myself, about selfishness, how I think about it, what like goes into that for me. I, I think about selfishness often. And that was another thing that brought me towards seven is that I'm always looking at myself from that lens, I guess, for no reason. Like, I don't think that I am a selfish person, but I'm always like checking that. But eight, it was more like an indulgence is that with the vice, right? Like it's like a overtaking. So the vice of the type seven is gluttony. So it's like a gluttony of experiences or like wanting to like take in life. Yeah. I feel like something very type seven about you, Aisha, is that you have like the energetic feel of a seven, like you have the puppy dog energy. So you have this like excitability to you. Um, that's kind of like sometimes beyond words. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but um, yeah. So sevens have FOMO and, and that like type of thing. You can compare Aisha with all of us and she is the most like energetic and like just excitable and just like, you know, just there's a lot of energy coming off of you. 
and in a way that a lot of us don't have as much energy coming out of us, at least externalized. Yeah, I would say the difference I noticed between like the um, vice of the seven and the eight, because I like seven is my wing. I've wondered between seven and eight a lot, like in my, you know, past of trying to figure out my Enneagram type. But I think the difference that I notice is like the seven, it's kind of a more indiscriminate gluttony. Like it's kind of like whatever is happening is what I'm like interested in following along with and like kind of figuring out where it leads. Like there's kind of excitement in everything and I want to engage with everything. Whereas I think there's a lot more direction to the lust of the eight. Like there's a very, very like intense focused energy to the eight when they want something and everything else kind of disappears. Whereas like I find with the seven, um, they can get very, very intense when they're, especially like when they're researching or learning or like, you know, integrating into five. But as a general mode of operation, they're more kind of tuned into everything that could possibly be happening. Um, as opposed to like the eight, I think has more blinders on. So it's like a similar thing, but it's energetically very different. I was just thinking about this the other day. Cause like I, I came across your, your profile and stuff and how cute it was. And I, you know, I disintegrate into seven and, you know, once upon a time years ago, people were like, oh, you're an ENFP, so you must be a seven, whatever. Um, and I was like, that doesn't really make sense, but sure. Um, I noticed like the dip, like something I specified, the difference between me like disintegrating into seven and an actual ENFP seven, like is when I'm disintegrating into seven, I'm scattered and like, you know, drinking wine, too much wine and having too much pizza and bouncing around multiple projects, but I'm anxious and I don't feel good about it at all. Whereas like the seven, the legit seven actually does enjoy doing all that. They enjoy going out. They enjoy trying all these different stuff and they're rocking it. Like they usually, they're, they're just rocking that whole experience. Whereas like they're, I'm, I'm a little bit of a mess when I'm doing that. And that's interesting too, because I think it, I'm going to behave that way always I'm always going to have this yeah. excitable version of myself that lives here but I it's like if I don't feel good that's still going to happen I'm just going to feel differently about it and that's what I think the yeah. the, the path to one is like okay, but I just need to do what's right like okay well this is what's right for me like I am always doing whatever the hell but like it feels differently for me when I'm not feeling good because I'm only looking at what, what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of and sense. And I get, I get very black and white, all or nothing. Um, and seven, I think to me, like the way that you can kind of flip the coin between vice and virtue is like, I always encourage this uh, authenticity from people and just like making your contribution you know, and I feel that, like you said, you visited my page and it's always like upbeat, or, but I don't want to project that onto people also. Like, I don't want that to be the only thing that people experience about me. Um, so that's where I think my virtue is like, well, like I, I try not to, I'm trying to empty my cup always and just take in mm -hmm. what is being presented to me that's like the opposite of what I tell people to do right I'm like no be, be you and have your purpose in the world but I'm like but not me I want to be completely empty so I can take in what's being given and then just like whatever I do that's awesome that that's a really good way to highlight the like the wisdom aspect of the seven like yeah, I, because I, I think they better. they come off aloof, and I get embarrassed a lot about some of the things that people say about sevens, or I read about sevens, or like I'm like they really for real think that like I really don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't like people think that I do not give a shit, but I get so many shit. <laughs> They're piled up everywhere, shit everywhere. You just know what matters, <laughs> like that that joy, and being able to, like you said, like take in things while it's there. Aisha, I don't know if, 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> you were doing your five pods. I was like, oh, no, you're good. Pause. You're good. You're good. I'm good. <laughs> I was like, I was, like, just did. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say, um, Aisha, I don't know if you ever landed on your um, instinctual variants, but a lot of what you're saying strikes me as very social seven. Like when you talk about that desire to like have everyone like like to be very aware of if you're being like selfish at all and have everyone else's needs met. Um, that reminds me a lot of the social seven subtype, which is also the counter type, I believe, for the seven. And it makes mm -hmm. the seven present a little bit differently from the descriptions. Right. Yeah. Like Alexa and I are, we have a lot of similar views, her and I. But our conversations sometimes are like parallel to each other somehow. It's funny. I don't know. That's, and, and that could be very much. Sometimes I see any of too. Once you have a kid, then your whole, then your whole shit could. It, like it's different i don't know <laughs> yeah and i'm not to be clear i'm not saying like i think you're two i'm saying like the social seven can have two-ish qualities um mm -hmm. that make them very aware of like oh am i behaving selfishly versus not selfishly which you don't necessarily see with the other subtypes of seven right excellent and so isha i was wondering how do you relate to the virtue of constancy? I think, uh, like I said, knowing that I'm always going to be that way and knowing that it's a good thing, it's positive. You know, just because I feel differently with myself doesn't mean that, you know, this, this path that I've been on, this journey that I've been given um, that changes, you know, I used to feel like intensely badly about, um, like I would be suffering with something and then I would like go to work and it would just be like, it doesn't exist, you know, it, and the compartmentalizing can be such a positive thing. But for me, it was more like, I truly felt better because I was around people that I care about and that I enjoy and that I love. You know, it wasn't about pushing things to the side. Like, if you asked me to bring it out, I definitely could have. But it, it's more about if I'm able to be out in the world. Like, I don't know who said it, but like, oh, oh it was Shan. Like, how dare I rob somebody of my presence? You know what I mean? And, and knowing that and being able to say that out loud and not feeling selfish, not saying that my presence it is a good thing. And I know that because I see it over and over and over and over. But like knowing that about yourself, if you don't feel like you're in the best place, being present can be very hard. You know, because you feel like you're not going, you're, that, that value that you truly have within yourself is going to be somehow taken away from you. Like, you know, if I'm just in the room, sometimes that is all I have to give. But that, that's peace for me. You know, I know I am up to it. Yeah, definitely. And so, Aisha, the defense mechanism of the seven is rationalization. And I was wondering if you could quickly talk about that. Well, and that's I, that's um, the one is that sometimes I can't rationalize everything. You know, uh, I don't know why I can just say to somebody, have you ever done Myers-Briggs? you an ENFP? Like, and just have that conversation. Like, uh, but if I'm, if I'm in that rational state, I'm like, why? Because you want to talk about Myers-Briggs right now. And you want, like, it's all about, then it becomes about me. And it's about, like, why am I doing this thing? Sometimes any makes no sense, zero sense. And I have to just, like, accept that. And that is so hard for me because there is no rationalization sometimes. None. None for me. Not for me to know. So it's more like I have to let go of that. Yeah, but I can see when I am not healthy how I, I beg for it. Why? I wish this would make sense. I wish I made sense. <laughs> like, I wish I knew why I wanted to do this or had to do this. And I also think that sevens can probably all relate to some kind of like autonomy of like I read about sevens like struggling with addiction and fortunately like I have not struggled with addiction but I feel like I understand 
the way that Addie behaves. That like, I might not be able to always be the way that you need me to be. So I have to like, it's weird. Like it's weird. You have these like hidden like things. I'm glad you're shaking your heads because I'm like, God, I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes sense to me. It makes total sense. It's making me think about Russell Brand. I think he's a seven and he struggled with addiction his whole life. And something he has an issue with is like, he'll say something and then people, he'll lose people. So in interviews that he's done, like he'll, he'll be on talk show, he'll say something profound and then people will 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 lose like him. Cause they'll go like, wow, you're so excitable and you're, you look so interesting. And, but there he's like, but he's saying stuff, but no one's taking it seriously because sevens will say something very deep, but in a happy way. And so then people don't take it seriously. So it just and reminded me. people like, you're so pretty, hon. You're so pretty. Thank you. Oh, girl, girl, girl my life. <laughs> the bank, you're don't you're, worry. you're yeah, just yeah. pretty, aren't you? <laughs> Look at your little body. Yeah, whatever it is that you just, whatever you just said. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, you should, okay. you should be quiet. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. I know. <laughs> Excellent. And so ENFPs, your your ideas on this? I mean, my first thought was that I never get that feedback, but maybe you guys are just prettier than me. <laughs> but in more seriousness, I'm kidding. I mean, like, we're all beautiful. But um, I think what you said about addiction is, like, actually very profound because you don't have to be addicted to, like, you know, there's certain substances where we're like, okay, if you overuse this, we call you an addict. But it's like, that you can be addicted to anything. You can be addicted to legal things. You can be addicted to, like, feelings. You can be addicted to a certain, like, way of doing things. And so I think what you said about, like, oh, I, I haven't struggled with addiction per se, but I understand that mindset makes total and complete sense. And I think we need people who understand that mindset from a very rational uh, point of view and also understand that it permeates a lot of different things. So I think it, you know, that actually makes sense. Yeah, and they sense. say the universal addiction is uh, ad an addiction to our own thought patterns and our own ways of thinking. So everyone is addicted in their own way. <laughs> I think also, sorry, I just want to plug this too, because Caitlin and I are so alike, right? Even when we have conversations, I'm like, damn, we have the same thoughts, but I don't know what it is that I, it is about energy. Seriously, we just have a different energy. That is all. It is. That's so funny you say that because I was going to say so much of what you're saying, I relate to so much, especially like the, the feeling like you have to show up a certain way. Um, which might be self-imposed, obviously, you know, we, we have our own stories. We tell ourselves about how we need to be in order to be loved or approved or enough or belong. Um, but so for a while, I wondered if I was a seven, but it's just, I knew that I wasn't because of that energy difference. I knew, I think maybe when I was younger, I had that, but I haven't had it for quite a long time. But um, yeah, I, th I felt thought the exact same thing. And then there was something else to It'll come to me. I'll let somebody else talk, but that I had another thought too that was uh, that I related to. I'm actually curious about how many of us first identified as seven, like discovering the Enneagram type, because that was the first type that came up for me. Like everyone, yeah, <laughs> yeah not surprised. I think uh, any is oft any and se in general are just often very much so associated to seven. Um, especially when you're in that excitable mode, anyone is like, oh, you're exactly like a seven because you're excited right now. But uh, wait, wait, we have a new member in the chat. <laughs> it, it, oh. It's cat. It's cat. <laughs> He's my cat. She just like, she can't sit still right now. She's all over the place. <laughs> What's her type? Oh, is she a seven? I, I can't be certain, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I'm sorry you guys kept getting cat butt. <laughs> I live for cat butt. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I, yeah, I mean, I related to a lot of what you were saying, Aisha. I just, um, maybe it's just because of that, like, harsh inner critic voice. It's like, maybe seven is an integration for me, but I just 
like struggle to feel good about I think anything that I do or like any mode of being um and and like yeah I like I I relate to a lot of it but um I think I need to do more like reading and thinking about in what ways is 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 it healthy like what what does what does that healthy integration look like um for for me so i have lots to think about. you need to come hang out we'll have an integration day <laughs> yeah <laughs> who, who wants to have like a figure out marie's type yeah. party <laughs> i just I like remember. integration day idea <laughs> it'd be so intense <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, I remembered the other thought that I had. So Aish, I'm curious what you would say about this. I think the other difference maybe between uh, two and seven that I've been reflecting on since I've, since talking about the pride humility thing, and I realized I was like not looking at that the right way, that, that um, I think for me as a two, I worry that I need to show up a certain way to be of service. And if I'm not being of service or if I'm needing help, it can feel like a burden. And I'm wondering if as a seven, is it more like, if you're not showing up completely positive or you might have a negative thing to or a negative thing to bring to the table if that's the thing that feels difficult to allow yourself to bring that part of yourself right like you're that's that's like spot on because i can if i feel like i can properly men mesh into the room like maybe i would be more comfortable going to like a work thing than a family thing or something like i mean you probably relate to that that's a pretty easy example but like i feel like i would be more apt to if i have to share something yes negative if i'm in a negative space then i'm going to be sounding off, off about negative things like i'm going to be giving something that i don't want to give and i know it's going to happen because because <laughs> right here it happened <laughs> it happened. And I, and that's not like that's the the purpose that I have again. <laughs> I gotta empty the cup or something. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I loved what Shan said earlier about um like if we can hit that point of integration or or um accept that other side of ourselves, that that's really when we're giving the most to people because I'm sure like I for one will say like bring your negativity, bring all of it, you know, bring everything. And and I think similarly, like if I could hit that point of uh, just bringing that I need things too, or, you know, for, for each of us and, and um, yeah, you know, we, we would be missing, we all miss out on a component of one another until we all feel like we can bring all of those parts to the table. So I like that what you brought up earlier with that, Shannon, uh, that was really made me think a lot. Thank you. I'm glad that helped. Yeah, yeah, that holistic integration of yourself is really powerful. And so in the, in hey. the sake of time, <laughs> and so, yep, for the sake of time, um, we'll move on to eight. And so Heidi, would you like to tell us a bit about you and your eight story? Sure. Um, well, it's interesting because, like, I find it hard sometimes, kind of the way I find it hard to define any what eight is because it's almost like I had to come to the realization that was my type through realizing like, oh, everyone isn't thinking this way. Like that was my kind of aha moment. Um, Cause I, I looked at like the stereotypes of the eight and was like, I don't really identify with those. But I think what I had to realize was very eight when I realized other people weren't doing this is like my entire worldview, like from the time I remember having thoughts is just being hyper aware of my own autonomy as a human being and everyone else's autonomy. Like I live in a world where everyone is looking out for themselves and it's not a malicious thing. It's not like, oh, everyone's out to get each other. It's just like, I'm just super aware of the fact that I'm the only person in my head. I'm the only person in my body. Um, no one else understands what it's like in here. I don't understand what it's like for anyone else. So there's this kind of natural responsibility. Like I, I feel like I'm very responsible for myself, for my needs, for getting what I need out of life. And so is everyone else. Um, and I didn't realize that other people don't feel like that. Like I truly, until it was explained to me, like what it's like for other people, I didn't realize that was not a very natural way of um, perceiving the world. And so I think like, I wrote down a few things here because um, actually a lot of things other people said kind of like gave me some contrast in an interesting way. Um, 
but yeah, it's, so it's kind of like I see people in the world as this, like everyone has their strategies for like getting what they want. And that's a very neutral thing. Like I think sometimes other types can assign like, oh, people are out for themselves. That's selfish. That's whatever. I'm like, no, nah, it's just self-preservation. Like everyone is self-preserving. So sometimes your needs align and that's great. And sometimes they don't align and then you're in trouble. Um, but the strategy that's never made sense to me is like waiting for someone else to notice I have a need and then like pulling it out of me. Like to me, I'm like, that's the, that's the absolute worst possible strategy anyone could ed- ever employ is like not speaking up. Um, and it doesn't even occur, like it doesn't even, it makes no intuitive sense to me why that would be something someone does. And now I've learned more about it through type, right? But I always assume like if people are saying something, that's what they mean. And if they're not saying something, it's because they don't like have anything to say or they don't mean what they're like. Um, so I've had to learn that a lot. And I think like what it comes down to is like the eight is kind of stereotyped is like, oh, they always have to be in control. But for me, it's like, well, everyone's in control of themselves at all times. Like that's not... It's not like, oh, I'm in control of other people. Like, I'm in control of me. Michelle's in control of Michelle. Asia's in control of Asia. It's just like the level to which that realization is conscious for you, I think, is higher for the eight. Like, we're very aware of our ability to impact our own lives in a way that, like, I think not everyone else is as aware of. And the flip side of that would be, let's say, when I talk to, like, twos, I'm like, okay, they're very aware of interdependence in a way that I'm not at all at all aware of interdependence it's just not in my awareness in the same way until i consciously work on like integrating that um but yeah that was kind of what made me like my aha moment with type was not so much oh i fit this like stereotype or this image of the eight and more like oh are like other people don't think of the world like that and that's astounding to me um so that was kind of like how i came to my type in a kind of roundabout way that's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you figure out your type by figuring out that other people don't do the same thing as you do. It's kind of like mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so, so Heidi, um, how does that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, for sure. <laughs> and, and so, and so Heidi, I was wondering about your relationship with the vice of lust and the virtue of innocence of the eight. Yeah, I think um, the way I would describe like lust for at least me, like I don't know if this is relatable to other eights or whatever, but it's almost like um, I think my my stimulation threshold for everything, like absolutely everything is way up here. So it's kind of like I can look very extra or very like intense or very gluttonous, but it's because like, like everything below here, I don't feel or notice my attention doesn't get drawn to things that aren't very intense so it's like I need to do everything in a way that other people will tell me is like very extreme like it's but it's like for me extreme things are easy and and simple things are hard because it's hard for me to kind of sensitize myself enough to pay attention to like like subtle nuanced things mentally I can do it but kind of like emotionally and energetically I I have trouble like picking up on subtleties but as soon as something's very intense like it's very comfortable for me like I like to kind of direct all of my energy at once and be very like energetically activated um so that that passion of lust like the feeling that I think has governed my life is like wanting intensity and wanting to go after things in a very very intense way um in a very focused way in a very like directed way and my, like, I, I function best when my energy is very, very, very activated and engaged with something. And I struggle the most if I'm not in, like, engaged with intensity. Um, cause it just feels like, oh, like I, like I, it's like the, I always describe to people as like the opposite of a highly sensitive person is like what I am, where it's like highly sensitive people feel like, overstimulated all the time and it feels awful I'm like when I feel understimulated it feels awful like it feels like my skin is on fire like it's like I need to do very extreme things so that's kind of how I I see like the lust for myself personally I don't know if that's how the other eights experience lust but that's always what it's been for me and then the innocence I think um there is like this Enneagram conference that I went to one time and I forget who said this but I was in a presentation where they were like going through kind of how they would symbolically represent all of the virtues of each of the types. And I almost can't even like say this one without getting emotional, but they're like, 
the, the kind of core of the eight's virtue can be thought of as like a baby sleeping on its stomach or on its back with like its arms above its head. And like it's just knowing that like it's in a world where someone's going to come take care of it. And like nothing has ever hit me quite as hard as like that description in that like I heard that was like that's the feeling of that, like the the feeling I get in my body when I think of that is like the number one thing I spend my life trying to protect in like myself and other people. Like that that is the most gut-wrenching thing I can imagine is just the trust that a baby has in the world. And it um especially as like a social eight, which is the counter type, but um, it's kind of this joke with the social eight where it's like, oh, if you want to know what the social eight is repressing in themselves, look at who they surround themselves by, because we have this tendency to kind of like see the vulnerabilities in other people. And we repress that in ourselves. So I feel this intense draw to like take care of people who are like wearing their heart on their sleeves or like who I see as vulnerable in some way. Like I want to collect them and like be very protective over them. And I didn't realize till I read that, but that's because like I'm I'm trying to protect myself. <laughs> but um, I really see that virtue in the way that like I interact with the world. Like I have a very natural tendency to like protect innocence that I never had language for before I um, started getting into the Enneagram. I teared up. I, I actually like really did tear up. Um, it, it's so innocent to want to protect innocence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I guess that's true, actually. Yeah, it's like that's all I relate really to so much I, of that. <laughs> I relate to so much of that, like just integrating into eight, you know. Um, and I was just sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, how many of us are like the counter types to our types in this chat? Yeah. Like, there's at least three of us. That's interesting. I think my boss is an eight. And just the way that she, oh, so many people like see her as being abrasive. I seriously see her as like a newborn baby. Like she is just <laughs> as vulnerable as she sees. And the way that she treats me, the way that she speaks to me, because I feel to her as like, too sensitive or something or like she can feel that I care so much so she is just so careful with me and she chooses words differently she behaves differently I just see the the extra like thought that she puts into her care it's like being loved by an eight is kind of overwhelming <laughs> overwhelming <laughs> feedback I get a lot <laughs> <laughs> So I have such a wide oh net, and they're just so like, okay, you too, like get in, get in. Like, <laughs> the like push through it, putting people in their boat. Like I, that's how I see eight. It's funny that you said that mm -hmm. life is so about um, having like your own autonomy, <laughs> but you're always putting people in your boat. Like it's so blind, <laughs> like blind to it. <laughs> Yeah, like hearing the type description like in ENFP language, like without having to translate between like different types there is just so illuminating. And yeah, I definitely relate to like the protectiveness and that was so that was like that was so cool. I'm like, oh gosh, suddenly like I've had so many eights in my life. Like both my parents are EST eights. My oh, older God. brother's an eight. <laughs> like, I have you, so many eights in my life. You and poor like, thing. <laughs> that's, that's a very intense household. <laughs> yes. And, like, I'm like, oh, gosh, that now I, okay. That, like, clarified some things because it was all in, like, very different language from from me with um, NEFI. They were all S-E-T-I and T-E-S-I. Wait, S-E-T-I. T-E-S-I. I said that right. So, like, hearing that in my language was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's also been a journey for me of, like, learning to translate these things into my own language, because a lot of what I read about the eight, I'm like, that doesn't fit for right. me, or that doesn't quite feel like it describes me, but then it's like, I can marry the energy with 
like my understanding of my MBTI and it makes a lot mm-hmm. more sense. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are certain types I think like Marie was saying about the one where the descriptions are kind of written based on the common denominator of like MBTI types that we see with that type. I think one is one where you often see it associated with IJ types and like eight is one that you often see associated yeah. with like two days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like that's another part that's like adds, adds another layer of toughness of figuring out your type is like they conflate these different characteristics onto the type instead of just giving you the straight narrow definition of like what's going on here. Yeah, and like with the type six, like my type, it's associated with SJs. So when I read the description, it sounds like an SJ, and I'm like, this doesn't sound like me. Yeah, like nope. But it turns out I am one, so it's weird. Yeah, I absolutely <laughs> dismissed it out of hand. Yeah, for a while until I dismissed it. I translated right. it in boot camp, Heidi. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the the descriptions sort of like top level Enneagram descriptions don't do a good job of differentiating between things that are emotional or um, sort of in, in the idea space and things that are like tangible and like how you're, how you look like, um, you know, all the one stuff talks about like one's lives are very, you know, ordered and rigid. And it's like, well, not necessarily, I mean, like sort of, but like my inner life is very, like that like it, my, my inner life is very one um even if I don't feel like I see myself in the more like sensing type parts of the descriptions so I don't know I, I think I wish there were more content that looked at like well more content like this <laughs> that looked at both because I really feel like you need both to get a full picture yeah yeah completely totally I was also just going to say, I've seen Caitlin on mute like three times. So <laughs> I just want to check in if like there was something you were trying to say, Caitlin, but uh, was it working? Oh, I appreciate that. And I feel like that's the perfect segue. The fact that you just had uh, called that out <laughs> for me. Uh, th- what I was going to say is um, when you were talking about protecting innocence, um, I was like, oh, I, I totally relate to that as a two. Like my... Um, uh, I've talked about this before in other uh, typology discussions that I had this obsession growing up with the catcher in the rye. I loved Holden Caulfield and how he loved to preserve innocence and protect people. And his whole thing was wanting to catch everybody. And so I've often thought as a two that I relate to that. But I was just thinking that eights do that. It's it's almost like two and eight are two sides of the same coin when it comes yeah. to stuff like that. Yeah. And I was thinking, because you said how you you might tend to, um, especially socially, will surround themselves with people that who wear their heart on their sleeves and who they feel like they want to protect. And I'm laughing because you surrounded yourself with me through throughout the <laughs> yeah. and and I was thinking like that um it's it makes me think of uh what maybe a lot of us have thought at some point about the ENFP INTJ relationship. Um where I often feel like ENFPs feel that INTJs appreciate their logic and their ability to, uh, and like their strength. And I think INTJs feel seen by ENFPs for their emotion and their warmth. And so I feel like the same happens with a two and an eight. There's a mutual respect of the way that each shows strength and each shows like kindness and vulnerability and courage and all these different things. So and that it just made me think of all that. No, it's like, and it's funny you say that because I think you were someone where it's like, as soon as I talked to you, like off Twitter, and I was building the boot camps, I was like, I want to work with this person so bad because it's like, like you have, like the way you think is alien to me in a really like positive way. Like the way you'll kind of like look at a situation, you're like, oh, we should check in with this person. We should, like, you're all about that independence and you do it with me too. Like, it's like you'll kind of notice when, like, you'll pick up on some subtle, thing that maybe I'm feeling that I haven't noticed. And like, like sometimes I would be like on a call with Caitlin because Caitlin's like my co-coach in the boot camps, And she would like address some like anxiety or stress that I was having that I didn't know I was having. I just knew I felt weird. And I was like, how did you do that? You alien being like in like a very good way. Like I'm, I'm very impressed by it because I think like twos are able to pick up on the, that emotional nuance and subtlety and to exactly what I said, like, oh, the worst strategy I can think of is sitting there waiting for someone to reach into me and like pull something out and help me with it. 
like you naturally do. And the reason I think is the worst strategy is because like, I don't know how, like it doesn't make any sense to me. Like I don't know how to, um, like I can pry with other people, but I don't think in, intuitively that people can meet each other's needs really. Like I think everyone just has to meet their own. So when I see someone who does it and who succeeds at it, like you do all the time, I'm like, wow, <laughs> what is that? Like, give me that. Um, well, and, I'll, and I'll just, thank you, first of all, but I'll, I'll also say like, uh, I think from, I, I bet others would agree with me too, not just a two point of view, but I think uh, looking at an eight, just like speak, truth and like and speak it clearly and I admire that so much and it's something that that I would work towards so it's it's great like I, I went what you said about um you said about how you you don't oh, you said something about people just saying what they mean and that you just figure people say what they mean and I thought that's why I trust what an eight says so much because I think they're just saying exactly what they think there's no no bones about it anyway sorry <laughs> I love how like anytime we have an ENFP panel at a certain point it's just a giant love fest everyone's just like you know I love this about you and I love this about you like it's a matter of time <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing I love that it more love to go around everyone's each other's cheerleader here <laughs> yes and so Heidi what is your experience with the defense mechanism of denial of the eight <laughs> um yeah that one's interesting because like I've had this discussion with other eights, like all of us hear that and we're like, that is not at all our defense mechanism, which is like ironic, right? But I think, I think what it is, is like, cause it's like more so than like most other times when an eight sees like a problem in their life, like I want to go into that problem a hundred percent. Like I have no, I have, I don't even have the ability to like ignore a problem. Like it, it, I can't, my entire physiology is wired towards approaching it and fixing it. But um, like I said, like stimulation threshold is up here. So it's like all the problems down here were kind of like, I guess you could say we're in denial of in that, like other people will sometimes see things in me where I'm like, oh, that's not, I'm not at all, you know, dealing with that or feeling that or whatever. And it's apparent to other people. It's not apparent to me because it didn't meet my stimulation threshold. So I think you could call all of that denial. Like I think the problem mates have is a lack of awareness about the subtleties related to their own needs and their own emotional state. And so we like, we, we deny our weaknesses in a sense in that we don't focus on them or really notice them. But once we do notice them, I really truly think at least for myself, like if I'm, if I realize something like something makes it to my conscious awareness that like, I need to work on this, I will work on it harder than like <laughs> anyone else will work. Like, I will go down to the depths of that thing and pull everything I can out of the trenches and like tackle that problem. But I have, it has to make it into my awareness first. And there are a lot of things where I think like, maybe I'll get subtly aware of them and then be like, eh, that's not really a problem. Or like, that isn't really something that needs to be dealt with. So I think that that's the denial that the eights have is like, um, like earlier when we were talking about the four tendency to recognize like every trigger matters, every feeling matters. Um, that's what the eights don't naturally do. Like we, we can get like a slight awareness of something and be like, that doesn't matter. Um, and the denial is very, very present in that. It's almost like, oh, something only matters if it's huge and pervasive and in your face. Um, and like my own kind of healing journey always takes me into the realm of the subtle and, and forces like I have to force myself to give validity to like small triggers, small emotions, small um, pieces of information. And like, that's how I grow is, is by kind of ceasing to deny that those things matter. Um, but yeah, the, the realm of like whether or not something matters and needs to be worked on, I think is where the denial like shows up the most. That was super, super, super well in depth and insightful. And it's bringing up things for me too, because I have an ENFP best friend who is a seven wing eight probably. And she would relate a lot to what you just said. Like when ENFPs or, or when ENFPs with eight, like they know that what they have to improve on, they go all out on it. Like they, like they, they, like they just need to know. And that's something she's told me before. And to hear you say it's like, oh, it hits, it hits home. <laughs> and and so ENFP thoughts, comments on what Heidi said? I wonder how often like that situation will happen, Heidi. And you'll find yourself like, it's almost like eights 
when they hear about something that they that is like a subtlety or like a problem that they're not identifying and then it happens again then they're like oh like it has to happen again like you can't like it's hard for eights to like look back at the experiences and have the same and like build that idea that this had affected this person differently than it would have affected me or like something like that. But when it happens again, then it's like, it won't happen again. In my experience with eights, like that's what I see. Like sevens, I feel like someone can tell me something about myself and I'll be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, like I probably knew, <laughs> but like, it's just not in my realm to be working on that right now. And I might not work on it. Yeah, I think I think it can be both. There, like, there definitely can be things where I'm like, oh, I know I should work on that, and then I don't. But then it's like, then it's time to work on it, and then it's really time. But I also feel like I feel bad actually for a lot of reasons for the people who are close to eights. But one of the things I feel bad about is like we're so intense about what we believe, and so like I can be very judgmental, like very judgmental um, outwardly. Like I'll always say it to your face, but like I will, there I'll like kind of put someone down for doing something or be like, you know, that you're taking that too seriously. Like you're, you're like, and then all of a sudden I'll decide like, oh, actually that does matter. And then I'm all about like healing that thing and taking that thing seriously. And forever more afterwards, that will be a thing that I've decided deserves to be taken seriously. So I feel bad because I noticed like I'll have hot and cold shifts like that. And like the way I treat people around those things um, is very different based on where I am in that process. And like, obviously that's something like now that I'm aware of that tendency, like I, work on a lot but that's also a way I think to tell what an aid is repressing is like what they're making fun of other people for like being too sensitive about or whatever is probably something that they have some hurt or some grief or some pain around that like they're repressing so when they see someone else doing it they're like well, put, like put that away like you're not supposed to feel bad about that and that's how I've started to notice where I need to do my own healing is like what I'm judging other people for expressing and for like putting out there it's a very very like clear and direct tell usually <laughs> shan is dancing over here <laughs> just acknowledging all the things i've seen <laughs> like, oh thank you okay i'm not crazy <laughs> this is wild to me because this sounds like so foreign like i I don't relate to a lot of it. I mean, like I, I can understand it as you're describing it. You're you're describing it really well. But I mean, you, you talk about Caitlin seeming like an alien. Like it, I'm kind of almost having that feeling. Like, wow, th this I I didn't realize. I don't know. It's just cool to to hear from an ENFP's perspective because like there are some ways in which I can like super relate to what you're saying and then others and I'm just like wow I didn't know an ENFP could be like that and I think that's really cool yeah, yeah it is chaos sometimes between the two like the <laughs> crossover of the eight and the ENFP because there are odds in a lot of ways because it's like I want to be on good terms with everyone but then like my eightness like takes over sometimes and I'm like I have to say what I think and it's and but then I want to go do the repair work so it's like yeah, it's a mess. I don't recommend, like, zero out of five stars don't recommend the combination. But, like, <laughs> no, I feel like that too, though, like, with the one and ENFP. <laughs> yeah, I think, I feel like everyone feels like that to some extent about their own yeah. type. Like, wouldn't recommend to a friend. No, would not. <laughs> Let's say, like, I get kind of stubborn in my reactions to, like, not in the same, like, judgmental way, but, like, if it doesn't make sense to me, I just get stuck. I'm like, but but why? They're like, it doesn't matter why. It doesn't have to make sense to you. Just listen to what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm listening, but like, but why? <laughs> I get stuck in like this seemingly like pseudo stubborn loop, but like, if I really don't get it. Like, I'm, I'm like, it's not going to go in. I'm not going to react to it. I don't have to do anything different. Like, I'm just, I'm, st I'm frozen. <laughs> so does anybody else kind of have a thing like it? Like I'm seeing that in in Heidi, with like I have to have an initial reaction, and then once I it kind of gets comes through to me, it makes sense. It I can do it. Like, I mean, I definitely have stuff where I've thought about it. I've made some imaginary plan in my head that I think would work. 
but I haven't fully reconciled new things I've learned later. And those are the things that totally sideline me. But I'll be stuck until I see it once or twice in terms of going back and reintegrating it into the overall pattern. Um, and I think that's where repetition helps. But I also think like just from an age perspective, I that was a much, much, much bigger thing before I was like 36, 37, right? Like that was just huge. So I wonder how much of that's really about SI finally stepping up and trying to be helpful rather than just in the it's way. really good observation. Um, All right. That's lovely. <laughs> and so, Michelle, would you like to tell us a bit about the nine personality? I think that um, I've seen a lot of people think that they're nine because they say, oh, I have a fear of conflict. And I'm like, you don't know what fear of conflict really means when it pervades every single moment of every single day of your life. Because <laughs> uh, I can even use this conversation as an example. So like for me, I'm getting anxiety like thinking about you having to edit the video and like how long every person is taking and whether or not everyone has had a fair amount of screen time and like whether everyone's been able to speak their mind fully and clearly enough like is anyone being cut off is anyone like feeling like they're not being heard like these are like just constant thoughts inside my head no matter what the situation because I'm always like ready to have to step in if I need to to like stop and prevent the conflict um so I'm always like hyper aware of the potential of conflict, <laughs> which is very um, <laughs> anxious. <laughs> really? <laughs> Not to the same degree, but We're I know what you mean. We're all friends here, Michelle. <laughs> We're all friends for you. I know, and that's <laughs> and I think that I have had less anxiety with this conversation than in other situations because I know, like. Any ENFP will say if they feel that way. And like, I know that, you know, we're, we're all ENFP, so we're like taking care of each other. So that's why I haven't really like felt the need to say anything or step in because I do feel comfortable enough trusting everyone else. But it doesn't stop the um, constant <laughs> inner dialogue. <laughs> yeah. The nine wanting like to mediate the situation so there's enough peace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. <laughs> and so, Michelle, could you tell us about the vice of sloth and self-forgetting and the virtue of right action in the type nine? I think uh, that this is actually something that I have been struggling with lately is the vice of sloth. <laughs> um, and I, I let me see if I can find the exact quote. I tried to have it at the ready, oh, but it's not at the ready. Um, Essentially, I am quick to shut down if I'm overwhelmed. Um, so for example, like if there is, okay, I can use an example that happened a few months ago. I was at a dinner party, um, dinner party. We were just at a dinner at a restaurant and there were like six people and this girl next to me was super anxious the whole time. So I was worried about her. And then my boyfriend and his best friend were sitting across the table from each other. And like they started doing these like snide back and forth remarks. And there was just like a bunch of tension in the group. And there was this moment where I was like, okay, I need to step in and tell them like to stop. They're being stupid. They're like ruining everything for everyone by being this way. Um, but I overthought it and I kept thinking like, oh, is that the right thing to do? I'm, am I going to make things worse by stepping in? So I just ended up shutting down and then being really mad at myself later for not stepping up. Um, and I think that that idea of action for a nine is really important because it's easy to shut down when um, when there's a lot of conflict because you stepping in could only cause more conflict sometimes. So. But sometimes you have to. Wow, I'm sorry I'm getting so emotional. I want to snug her so bad. Come I know. I, wanna, I just want to hug you. <laughs> I know. You have no idea. Like, I, I relate to, I struggle with shutting down a lot myself. Like, I get pushed to react faster or more or want to say things that I'm not sure. And, don't, and I also don't like, you know, I don't like tension either. So... 
like I, I relate to a lot of that. So like, I want to just give you a hug. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot. It's overwhelming, right? Yeah. 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 You carry so much on your shoulders by trying to make everything right for people. I, I really, mm -hmm. really appreciate that. Yeah. I want to hug. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could turn it off because, like, it can uh, affect me in any area of life because even at work, I'll – be hyper aware of the relationships between other people and whether or not it's in a good place and then feeling the need to like find out if it is in a good place and if it's not like what I need to do to fix their relationship like it's my duty to take care of that for them like they're full-grown adults like they can do it but here I am like feeling this need to like fix the tension between everyone because I don't want to have that situation where people are yelling at each other. So let me do everything I possibly can to uh, get everyone to just, and it comes off a lot like Effie. I think a lot of people think that I'm like very strict about social rules or like whatever, or that like I'm, but I, it's not, it's not Effie. <laughs> like, it's just a genuine fear of conflict, <laughs> pervasive fear. <laughs> Can I ask, um, I was just thinking how I relate so much to what you said about that, like, I want to fix it, but then if I speak, it'll make it worse. And then it just, you know, spiral. Um, and I was thinking for a two, it almost feels like a, like a selfish thing for me where it's like, oh, I, I wouldn't want to make anyone feel bad or I don't want them to not like me if I say something. Or So I'm wondering if for you, because you had that emotional reaction when you were talking about, um, about what it would be like to say something and like have something get worse. What I'm curious what it is that comes up or like what the, what's behind that maybe driving that, that emotional reaction to the idea of that. Well, I do think that there is a particular element that is related to people not liking me. I definitely think that there's an aspect of that, but it could also be that that conflict would escalate to a point that I wouldn't know how to handle it. If I did step in and try to de-escalate if I accidentally did the opposite and escalated it further and then more people got in. So like using the dinner situation as an example, we're in a restaurant. So like, what if we get other people in the restaurant involved in our drama, which doesn't need to exist because they're just being stupid and not saying what's actually on their mind. They're doing all this like passive aggressive stuff. And if they would just not do that, when we're in public trying to eat our dinner, like I don't even feel hungry anymore. I just want to get out of here. Like, can we please, I don't want to be near either of you. I just want to be alone away from you guys. And that's where that like sloth reclusive part comes in where you're just like, all right, I'm done. And uh, then like, yeah. I relate to a little bit of that, um, but I think for a different reason like i to have a tendency to shut down but i think it's like i get overwhelmed with the expectations that i feel like other people have of me and that i have of myself and i will like shut down sort of like rebelliously like okay fine i'm just gonna sit <laughs> down in the middle of the road and you can't make me move um but also just like I, I'll get like sulky. Like if I go quiet when there's conflict at the table, it's because like, I think you're being like stupid or mean and I'm resenting you for it. And I'm just sort of like sitting there like <laughs> with like anger yeah, th and there's the anger, like anger building up. Um, and like, it's not so much that like, I don't want to make it worse. Like I am actively trying to make it worse. I'm like, I hope you all see like how grumpy I am. This is what you're doing. Like, I don't know. So, so it feels like, like it might look a little bit similar, uh, but I think it's coming from really different places. Yeah. When I was, when I read the description for nine, um, I didn't relate to like, I don't like conflict, but only because I see how uh, like, annoying it is it doesn't affect myself in the way that i think that it affects a nine like they have the self-interest in like if there is a work conflict going on like in you're working in an office where there's like an active conflict like you are going to go home at the end of the day and you are going to feel 
in your body differently than I feel. Like it might be an annoyance to me or an inconvenience or something like that, but I don't share that same like. Plus, I almost when I sense a conflict or when I see it, I'm trying to interject myself into the conflict, but I'm not having that like. I might have tentativeness as because I don't know how to solve it or I don't know what value I'm going to provide, but not because not the kind of tentativeness that a nine would have that I feel like it's like the slaughter life. Like it would be better if I wasn't involved or I'm going to be not involved. Like I'm just trying to figure out how I should best be involved. <laughs> There's never a chance I'm not. Well, and I hardcore relate to what you were saying, Michelle, about not wanting to make it worse. Like I integrate to the nine. So I kind of get, I get to experience kind of the good side of it, right? Cause it's when I'm healthy and I'm moving towards the nine, but in terms of seeing how it could just all come apart. And if I do this, what are the 10,000 ways it could spin off? Yeah, I'm, I'm stopped way, 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 way before. Um, for me, it's not always about, will the conflict escalate, right? Because I do believe a certain amount of conflict can be cathartic and ultimately useful. For me, it's more about, does it lead to some more permanent solvency? And could I jeopardize that permanent solvency? Um, but hardcore relate to is it time to open my mouth like am i morally obligated to open my mouth and interject and prevent conflict in this situation or is it just going to make it go horribly awry and am i morally obligated to let this play out however it plays out and, and i think not it's really funny that you say that because i was also relating to you when you were talking about having your contingency plans but um when i access that it is in a very anxious and negative way so when i heard that i'm like ah that's stressful i know that state of mind but for you you're just like yeah that's just what i do i just like plan and prep and i was like wait what like you're not anxious about it <laughs> I have a story from just last night uh, where I was like actively trying to like walk into conflict, not like in a a super like bad feelings -y kind of way, but um, we were at my parents' house celebrating my husband's birthday and um, my dad was trying to talk politics and um, I was trying to gently, you know, push him on things. Well, well, what's, what specifically is going to happen? You know, like, what, what, what do you mean by that? And I kept sensing that my husband kept trying to like, kind of find common ground with my dad and like, a, and almost like minimize or redirect the things I was saying, which was making me very grumpy. Um, because I'm like, and, and, and I said something in the car on the way home. I was like, wow, you were really determined to keep me from fighting with my dad. And uh, he was like, yeah, did you see how it was stressing out our, our kid? And I was like, wait, really? What? And I just had not picked up on it at all. But I guess like our, our four-year-old was getting like anxious that mom and, and papa were, you know, disagreeing. And um, and for me, it, it, it's like, I felt like I was on a righteous crusade. Like I, I, I have to say this, like if I, if I don't like, you know, I'm part of the problem and like, I have to, I have to try to make him see, or, you know, just like in, in some, like I, I, no one was yelling, like no, everyone loved each other very much, whatever. Um, but I, it didn't even occur to me that like, even just like that disagreement, th that like slight lack of accord was, was like making my little boy feel anxious. And, and then I felt really bad about it, but. Yeah. It's beautiful that the nine doesn't want there to be conflict because I, I think the nine knows that conflict, it, it results in bad things. So they're trying to prevent that bad thing from happening, whatever they perceive that to be and at the cost of themselves. So it's kind of like, it's it's sweet, but it, it, it hurts. Like, I don't know, it's like taking a shot, like you're running in front of someone, you take a shot for them and then, but then you get a shot instead. That's how the nine feels like when it self forgets. But, it, it, but it's for the sake of no conflict. But yeah, so the defense mechanism of the nine is narcotizize, nar, 
<laughs> no cartization. No cartization. Narcotization. No That's a hard word to say. I think Narc- narcotization. Narcot- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I was looking at it too. I was like. <laughs> okay thank you thank you type two for helping me <laughs> i appreciate it do you guys have anything else um you'd like to say about the type nine i don't want to cut anyone off i actually think it's Neither just interesting do nine. Like, oh. <laughs> 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 it's like coming from the other end of the spectrum because there's like this stereotype that like eights love conflict right which is not untrue but it's like we love conflict the way that like a person with like cancer loves surgery, you know? Like it's like it's it's better than the alternative, which is like letting the tension simmer and like like constantly like being aware of it and just like so it's like I love when people just say the thing that's like there, but it's funny because it's like I think eight and nine look very opposite in that way. And like I dated a nine for eight years and it's like definitely very very opposite in our approaches to conflict but we both want the same end result which is for everyone to be on the same page and for no one to be feeling resentment which is like what's happening when those tensions start building and simmering and it's like at the end of the day like yeah some people might like conflict some people might not like conflict as a means of getting there but i think everyone doesn't like the tension and everyone wants it to stop so it's like in that way i think um, it's underrated how much like nineness is in everyone, even like types like eight that seem like they have none of it. It was kind of amazing to me, like the eight and the nine are so going about things so differently. That's immediately what I observed. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're both so sweet in like a similar way, but they're going about it like so opposite, you know? I think for like when I think about nine, sorry, Dara. Um, that like how um she was talking about not making like putting youtube videos out but like you and i the thought process around putting a video out would probably be so different like you prop just that feeling of like um i don't know like i feel like nine could get wrapped up in, in a tv show or something and just like watch tv for like a couple of days or something like that and like that terrifies me terrifies yeah. me it's, to get caught I, on and I'm just sucked in. I'm like, no, I have things to do in the world. Like, yeah. That terrifies me. It causes me stress that like I do that so often <laughs> that I go, I can so easily just let myself lose an entire day to just watching TV. It happens more than I'd like to admit. Oh, that is not easy for me. Like I probably need that sometimes. I need like the the shut down the you know whatever that is <laughs> that idleness okay but like a day of sitting around just watching korean dramas all day is just like heaven <laughs> it's just so worth it it's so worth it just like resets your brain i swear so i have a question for michelle how does sarcasm sit with you? Like, is that a thing? Well, that's funny that you ask. I think that I have become more friendly with sarcasm and it has turned into my main style of humor, actually, um, because I find I what I really love to do is have a reaction that's opposite of my real reaction. So like pretend to be offended when I'm not like... <laughs> I don't know why, uh, but I know, like, because my boyfriend is, um, he is incredibly sarcastic. So that has rubbed off a lot on me and helped me. Because um, I, I can't tell a lot of times if he's upset or if he's being sarcastic. And so that has helped me a lot. Um, and actually having to have, you know, arguments or disagreements with him has helped a lot, too, to realize, like, hey, it's okay if you're mad for a couple minutes and you let it out. You're gonna get over it, so stop trying to like be afraid of having anger for a second. That's fascinating because I just kind of feel like sarcasm is very natural for a lot of ENFPs, but it sounds like it's more of a learned a learned skill. Yeah. And I'm just 
I'm constantly amazed at these things that I thought were just every ENFP ever. And there's so much flavor and nuance in where to um, act. Oh, oh yeah, no, me is the fun. Your way. I feel like it's our way to like put in what we're actually, some of it is like what you're actually thinking or it's like a coaching technique or something. It's like a broad band style of humor and getting a little bit of something in there. <laughs> you're like, this hurts. Well, sarcasm is like a, an unexpressed anger coming out in a way. And so like me as the five, I didn't understand it for a long time because I was like, no, these things are separate. You're expressing anger right now. You're not being funny. And they're like, no, Shan, this is funny. I'm like, it's not funny. It's anger. Why don't you tell me the truth? So that took me a while, but believe once I got into it, it's fun to use it to express like contradictions. For sure. And I, I could imagine that'd be a lot of fun for a nine to start like tapping into being like, yeah, like, like getting a little more expression in. It is in fun to like, way. to push buttons when you know it's safe to push buttons. It's yeah. like practicing conflict in a, in a very safe environment. <laughs> yeah, I dig it. I like that. <laughs> That's so Beautiful. The concept of practicing the parts of us that are less used in a safe space. You're you're like practicing conflict in a safe environment. Imagine if we all had that. Like imagine how much healthier society would be if we could provide safe spaces for people to grow the sides of them that were a little more difficult. <laughs> Before we close up the panel, I'd just like to go over quickly the orientations. Let's start off with the assertive orientation first. And so that would be the eight, seven, and three. Would you guys like to say a little bit about that if you guys want? <laughs> I think I come I think I come off that way sometimes. Or like I like well when Caitlin was describing not like not being aware of needs and having unmet needs as she's repressing. I feel like I might be more aware of what exactly it is that I need and that I'm pushing aside. So I have like a, I feel, this is so hard to explain, but of the assertive types, I feel like their color is, is bolder, right? It's just, they just, it, there's more of them injected into that specific thing that you're talking about or like that is the space that they prefer to live in that's what they prefer to talk about the topics that they feel comfortable with and that's where i'm going to want to be like like heidi said about it being more tense i can get to a better level with you um and have a greater connection at least from an enf enfp standpoint like I'm more apt to, like, I want to know your opinion. I want to bring it out of you. And <laughs> bring it out of you, too. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, what I notice is a common thread between the assertive types, so three, seven, and eight, is this, like, two things. One, um, just proactive. I guess it's the same thing. Proactiveness is, like, the word I would use to describe it. Like, we're very much we all kind of take the stance of like, if something's going to happen, if I want something to happen, like I have to go make it happen or else it's not going to. Like I see that as a very, very strong line across the three types. Um, and that the kind of natural like life worldview orientation of like, I am happening to my life, not vice versa. Like I really notice with all these sort of types, like they're very aware of their impact, very aware of like their potential impact. And even if we're not acting, we have a natural awareness of the fact that like this problem could be solved through acting. Maybe I'm too lazy or like, don't feel like doing it yet, but I'm not waiting for the problem to resolve itself. Like I know I'm going to have to act in order to change the problem. Um, and I see that as a really common thread across like eight, seven and three, and we all have different approaches, but it's very present for like all of those types. Beautifully well said. Let's talk about the withdrawn types now. And and so the the three withdrawn types are the four, five, and nine. Would you guys like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. <laughs> um, 
I guess it's just like it's gestating. Like, one, I don't want to be overwhelmed, but um, two, like, I'm really, I'm not just reacting to things. I'm like really thinking through everything I'm doing or trying to at least. I find like the times I've tried to like sit there and react or pseudo react, I've sat there and I've created monologues in my head based on like other reactive types. Um, as to what to say, that was just wrong. It didn't end well for me. Um, uh, I'm just trying to make sure like what I say when I do say it is some sort of quality. Or at least I can get myself in a space where I'm not just reacting because I, because there's like, you know, my immediate like, whoa, and 15 different thoughts going on, but nobody can follow my any, you know, so I'm, I'm and I don't want to like blame somebody when they don't deserve it or cause damage to them or sit there and take damage myself. Um, so I'm trying to just sit there and like, I'm trying to like step, step out or step above the situation and look at it before I, you know, cause any impact I would regret. Cause I don't, I don't really have the energy all the time to go in there and keep throwing, like keep to use metaphors, like sit there and shoot a million soccer balls at a goal until I hit one and then repair all the 14 that didn't make it in. Is it like that for you, Michelle? Yeah, I think it's kind of funny because, oh, well, my lights just turned off. Um, I feel very much so the opposite of Heidi. Like, she's like, I need to jump in because if I don't take action now, like, nothing's going to happen. Whereas I feel kind of oppositely, like, if I take the wrong action, um, things could go a lot worse than if I just sit through and think it through a little bit longer and think it through a little bit more clearly. And I don't really like to involve myself with things that require being reactive in any sort of way. Like I, um, like even in my position at work where I am an operations manager, I still have, um, how do I say this? I work with an ESFP and she's very much so like Heidi. She is very much so let's get this done. Let's deal with it. Let's put it right there out in the open for everyone to deal with, which has been really helpful. Um, but my style and uh, is to avoid talking about the certain topics that I think would be negative or bring down the conversation and stuff like that. Um, because what's the point in talking about it if we can't resolve it at that exact moment? Um, and then just in, in general in life, I think that I uh, prefer like I can come off like an introvert, I think, because I like my alone time and I like being in my safe space where I can work on my projects. Like I write, I make YouTube videos, um, I make music. These are all very uh, individual things that I do that don't really require other people. And when they do, it's like when I choose to involve other people and not the other way around. So. Yeah, and so ENFPs who are in the withdrawn types 5, 4, and 9, they're most likely to be confused for an introvert out of all ENFPs. So that's something to keep in mind as well. I just wanted to say, like, to something Michelle said, when you were like, oh, I'm the opposite of that, and I'll kind of, like, assume that um, I might say something and it'll make it worse. That's very bad. I say things that make things worse all the time, where, like, if I had just, like, shut up and let the situation play out, it might have been fine. So it's like probably, and it probably would have been a lot more fine than like had I gotten involved. So it's like, <laughs> I feel like my, like the assertive type has, or triad has so much to learn from like with the withdrawn triad, especially because I'm in like a double assertive relationship. Like my partner's a three. Mm. And it's like 90% of our fights probably don't even need to happen. We just can't help it. Like, <laughs> but so it's like, it's funny because like you see where balance becomes very important. Yeah, I was just thinking that exact same thing as you were talking, like we both have a lot to learn from each other because there are times when just speaking up or just taking action is the right thing to do. And like just overthinking things isn't going to work, but sometimes slowing down and not taking action is good. If I could only learn to not lean too far to one side, that would be nice. <laughs> this is fascinating. <laughs> 
And so there's the compliant types, which is the one, two, and six. And so maybe we could go into that as well. I feel like they should be called sort of not all all two parts, but it's more like they're all trying to be systemically more supportive. Compliant. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, well said. Um, I haven't really looked at this aspect of Enneagram super closely, but I definitely, especially hearing the difference between assertive and withdrawn, there's definitely this, it feels like there's a way to make things better in a way that's good for everybody by recognizing that there's certain norms and balances. If you can just figure out what they are and try and optimize them, but it's not like it's, it's not like it's the answer to the balance between assertive and withdrawn. It's definitely its whole own thing, but I think we're all still striving for that end result of solvency and harmony and everyone's happy and all of that. But there's, there's definitely a need to balance and I don't know, for me, it's very much like, what are the possibilities that are actually going to work? I have to recognize certain truth about the situation that I'm encountering. And the only option set that's really useful to work in is the one that fits inside that space. So of course, I've got to be compliant to certain things. Does that make sense? Does that resonate with Caitlin Marie? Yeah, this is not something that I've looked into a whole lot. Um, and honestly, I, I almost feel like I relate more to the assertive types. Okay, it's so funny. I've always said... I don't know. Edit that out, boy. I, it, I, I've that always adds said, I think one, like one in my brain, I lump in with assertive types. That's very interesting to hear you say that. This is making me think of... Um, so I, I pursued acting for a bit in like 10 years ago or so. And um, I remember learning that in every scene, every actor in the scene has a motivation and that's what's driving the scene. And so um, you're always trying to figure out like who's in each other's way and whatever. And my sister and I were talking about it once. I think she's a, we think she's a three. And she was saying that she feels like most people have a target that they know that they're aiming for. And that she felt like my target was like off somewhere else. And I was just trying to help other people hit their targets. And and I and I think, and I don't say that to sound like, again, like a martyr or heroic. I actually think, and I don't know if I've just convinced myself of this or if this is the truth, but that I, I feel like helping other people hit their targets hits my target. So like that in and of itself feels like that's, and I, and I, like, I, I don't, I feel like that sounds like a, like a humble brag or something that I'm not trying to make it sound like. I just genuinely think that that's the only thing I'm aiming for typically. But once in a while, I might realize that I do have some other want or something. And so I'm thinking about how, like, maybe the assertive types in a movie, maybe they'd be the people whose motive is very clear and they're just, they're taking a direct line to it. And for me, not purposefully, but maybe it's more like a, like chess moves because I'm trying to find this perfect balance of that, how can everyone get what they want? And then somehow through that, I can get what I want. And so it's it's a lot, like I probably create a lot of convoluted steps for myself that are really unnecessary. <laughs> and maybe it would just be a lot more efficient or effective sometimes if I took a page out of the assertive playbook um, or even the withdrawn playbook at times, you know, like if I could tap into those sometimes that would probably be make my life and other people in my life that probably make their lives easier too. If I could just state it sometimes. I really related to that actually, like the, the idea of like finding a balance and sort of still getting there, but in uh, a way that tries to keep everybody happy or like, okay. Um, 
because yeah, I have I I'm very comfortable being assertive. I have I have no problem with it, but um, I almost think of it more as like an option, like in my tool belt, and, but not like my default mode of being if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think it's almost I just had this thought that it's like sometimes I want what I want, but if it interferes with someone else's want, then again it probably goes back to that two need of if I get in the way of their want to get my want, I won't feel good about it and they might not like me and I have hurt them in some way. So then I will just distance myself from that wanting. That's fascinating. I mean I really resonated with what you were saying about the targets, but for me, it was far less about my target is solving all of their targets. And it was much more, this is just a way to help me get what I want. If giving you what you want along the way helps me get what I want, then that's the best strategy to go after. Um, but it's that same strategy of just being aware of, is it time to be assertive? Is it time to be withdrawn? Or can I please people along the way? And that ultimately gets me what I want. But it's it's much more analytical and it sounds horrible to say out loud. Like I really don't think I'm like this horrible person trying to switch up the world. Um, yeah, anyway, but it's, it's far more analytical it, it, isn't it, in my head. It, isn't that kind of an ENFP thing? I mean, I... I keep I was gonna say the same thing I think that we always look for win-win so like if our goal can be accomplished through helping someone else's goal like no we're gonna go for that why would we choose a win-lose situation ever if we could choose well, a win-win that's an incredibly um compassionate way of of saying it but I was I was going to say like when ENFPs are manipulative that that's sort of the way in which we're manipulative right is is it's like um, pleasing people and like helping people feel good, but then like also finding a way to get what we want yeah, too. But then right? like it, I'll follow that up with that, manipulative is not in yeah. and of itself bad. It's whether it's how it's used that can be bad because manipulation is just a tool. You wouldn't say a hammer is bad. A hammer is just a hammer. Manipulation is just manipulation. We just have us as a society, a negative association to that word, but it is not always negative. I'm sorry, but I hate how like people say ENFPs are so manipulative, like it's a bad thing. Like, no, we're manipulative in a way that's helping so many other people. Like, let us be manipulative in this way. Like, it's a good thing. <laughs> Back off. We're I don't know what they're talking about. Words have connotations though. And like, I mean, maybe we should say persuasive or you know, like um deploying political skills i don't know but yeah i definitely feel like when i'm manipulative i don't feel good about it and i don't like want to lean into that but it's something that's definitely part of me i once texted a, an enfj friend we were like talking about something we we're trying to get a group of people to do and like a like trip we we're trying to plan and i was like what's a word for like when you're being manipulative but for good and she was like the word is enfj <laughs> and i'm Still, I still think of that like once a day. I never quite knew what they were talking about when I heard people ranting about how ENFPs were manipulative. Like, if, I, I don't know what they mean. I can't imagine. Okay, I think there are. I think there are unhealthy ENFPs, and I think that's where a lot of the stereotypes about ENFPs come from. Um, yeah. And I have met unhealthy ENFPs and they can be manipulative in the negative sure. way where they are taking advantage of other people. Um, and they aren't necessarily, they're like conflating how much they like people to get their way. They're like using their flirtatiousness to get their way, that kind uh, of stuff. And that's where that stereotype comes from, I think. And yeah, also okay. the type DSPs as well. But. I think, yeah, I can I think see, I can see that. I think we can be crazy manipulative. I've been crazy manipulative in my life. Like, it's like, <laughs> absolutely. But I think a lot of the time, ENFPs don't realize they're doing it. I really think that. Like, I think that the way NE manipulates is it kind of looks at every side of something and is like, well, here's the side that if I if I position it this way, 
seems like I'm doing the right thing and also gets me what I want. And we get really good at even convincing ourselves that like, that's the best way, but we know kind of like in our guts, there's a different way that maybe like isn't as favorable for us, but we can justify choosing this perception because it also gets us what we want. And it's like, I think it's an NE user thing in general. Mm -hmm. Like I think every, I really think every type manipulates in its own way. Like I've seen manipulative sure. versions of every single type, but it's like, I think that's the way ENFPs manipulate is we convince ourselves we're morally in the right. Like we pick the perspective of all the perspectives we can see on our Rolodex that puts us in the right and then mm -hmm. fight really hard for that and, and kind of blocking out other perspectives. And it's not always like conscious, but I think it's like right. very much there for most of us at some point or another. Sure. And I think there's also part of it where the way that we go about it seems foreign or less obvious or like we're just kind of out there flexing our diplomacy muscles but because you know it's not as blatantly tactical or strategic as other types it kind of feels like something that's being done on the sly when really it's just that's that's our intelligence that's where we're going with it mm -hmm. yeah so i think it, it kind of other types call us manipulative and yeah i was trying to get what i wanted but it wasn't like in this bad trying to not honor your needs way as well i also think it's like very manipulative this is something i rarely see nfps take responsibility for but i see them doing all the time it's very manipulative to like put people on pedestals and expect them to behave a certain way and we do that to people as nfps like all the time like i caught like idealizing mm -hmm. people and expecting them to conform to that ideal is manipulative as hell but like no NFP sees it that way. You have to like develop some awareness around it. But I think we're very inclined to naturally do that and not see it as manipulative because we we think it's like coming from an innocent place. But it is like expecting someone to be something that we want them to be is very manipulative. But it, we're not conscious hmm. of that. That is so true. And that hurts to hear because of how true it is. I feel that as a one, like a lot. I, I feel like that's one of, my like the the ways in which I impose it on other people it's it's probably in that way because like I don't go around with a clipboard saying like you broke this rule but just sort of the moral disappointment <laughs> um or even just like that conversation last night with with my dad I feel like it was it was sort of this like expectation of like well you need to see this and it, yeah it, yeah yeah, it makes sense. It actually makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. Yeah. Now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a discovery we had in the ink block video that we did with Heidi and I, Asia. And so, like with NE FIs, like sometimes depending on what the FI is feeling at the moment, it will interpret the ink blot differently. So it goes the same with how you interpret life. So if if your FI is coloring things, then it'll color how your NE will extrapolate from it. And that seems like what you guys are talking about. Like the ENFP yeah. will pick the perspective that uh, their FI wants the most rather than the one that is probably most true. That's why I'm careful I've definitely about noticed, using my voice because I feel like when you were talking about being manipulative, I feel like people have a natural inclination to listen to what we're saying because we can translate and land on so many levels and have so many different conversations and reach so many different people that we have to be so careful about what we're saying, you know, what, cause people are listening. Yeah, I was gonna say also like kind of ties in with that, that I've had moments where I, I'll, especially like in a text message conversation, I'll interpret something a certain way. And then, you know, obviously my reaction will be to what I assumed, you know, the story that I was telling myself about whatever was going on. And then when I give it distance and I come back and I can't remember the FI place that I was in and I read the actual just words, I'm like, how did I read it like that? This wasn't, they weren't being rude or anything. They just- Me I, all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. Yeah, so wonderful, wonderful discussion, ENFPs. So for the sake of time, <laughs> well, I, I love this chat, but for the sake of time, uh, I would say that um, this is an amazing chat. Um, I loved speaking with you all. 
you ENFPs are just so lovely. And I love how when you guys were talking about your types, you guys got really vulnerable. And, and you know, if you felt like crying, you let yourself cry. And like, thank you for that bravery. And thank you for that just courage to let out your genuine emotions. That's, that's a difference from the INFJ 9 Enneagram panel. No one really cried or got that vulnerable. But in this one, like as you guys were talking, like if it struck a chord, you guys like started crying. It was magnificent because when you're vulnerable, you teach other people to be vulnerable by, by showing them that it's okay. So, so thank you for just letting your genuine reactions pour out because it helps other people be, be okay with being genuine to themselves. Thank you everyone for, for coming out. Thank you for the insightful commentary you all had on your Enneagram types. And I really appreciate each one of you and your ability to articulate your experience so well and have it like resonate with other ENFPs. It helps build this sense of community and build this genuine bond between you guys because when you guys are truly telling your story and just truly showing how you feel it, it helps us get to know you all better and it helps us get to know each other better and that builds a better interdependent community like you know caitlin the type two really cares about <laughs> and so together we build a more interdependent community through each chat together and i feel more human when i listen to your stories like i feel more human when you guys genuinely open up and there's no money no money in the world can buy such a gift, you know? So thank you for helping, you know, me tap into my humanness and anyone who is listening to this tap into their humanness. That was really impactful to be a part of. And and so Heidi has, you know, a website, uh, you know, ENFP Bootcamp, and she has books uh, and, and Caitlin is helping with that. And Aisha, Sarah was a part of the bootcamp, so, they they'll they rave about it and you, you know it's good when you know half this panel is a part of the the boot camp <laughs> and i was a part of it too okay so but i'm not an enfp okay but it was so good that i had to go in and just try it because it's quality anything you know heidi makes is quality and so there's also YouTube channels, you know, Heidi has a YouTube channel and so does Shannon and so does Heart of Michi. Um, it's, it's quality material. Go check it out. It's in the links below. And the rest of you are on Twitter or on other social media that I'll link below. And like, just thank you for, you know, opening your hearts up and, and so that we can truly see into the Enneagram. Thank you for that experience. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love this. We'll do it again. Thank you. Yeah, this was a great panel. Like, this was so interesting and, like, raw. Like, I loved this. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce, for organizing, but also to all of you guys. Like, this was amazing. You are all a delight. I just, I want to echo everything Joyce said. Like, it, it feels... Like I feel so warm and like filled up just from having spent a few hours virtually. Like, yeah. Like, so thank you everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And thanks to Joyce for all the editing and making it happen. <laughs> yeah, we gave her what, four hours of footage to deal with, sorry. This is the <laughs> longest video I've ever had to look over again. <laughs> <laughs> What could you expect when you put nine ENFPs in a room together? <laughs> I'm shocked it wasn't longer. <laughs> like, I'm shocked we're getting away in four hours. Yeah, thank you for bearing your souls. Thank you, audience members, for watching this far. You have an amazing attention span and just willpower. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. Thank you.